Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the seventh meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2015. Can I remind all those present to ensure that you have all electronic devices switched off? Um, our first item is to consider two negative instruments. Um, I know the Minister is here, or the, sorry, the Cabinet Secretary is here this morning already in place, but she's not here for agenda item one, just for clarity. Um, we've got two negative instruments as set out on the agenda. Um, do members have any comments on either of these instruments? Yes, uh, Siobhan. Um, I would just like to place on record my disappointment. Um, at the first SSI 215 forward slash 97 says that no impact assessment has been taking place because it will happen in the wider context. Um, I think that's disappointing. But in the second one, SSI 215 forward slash 98, an impact assessment has taken place but hasn't been published yet. And so we're asked to pass orders that we haven't been given the full information for, and I don't think that's the right practice um, to be having, so I would like to place that on record. Okay. Anybody else got any comments they want to make at this stage? Um, I know the Minister's not officially here but yet, but I'm sure she she heard the comment. Um, I'm going to just move to the questions then, uh, and I'll just take both together. Does the committee agree to make no recommendations to the Parliament on these instruments? Is that agreed? Thank you very much. Um, our next item is to take evidence on the Post-16 Education Scotland Act 2013 Modification of Legislation Order 2015. Can I welcome Angela Constance, the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning, and our supporting officials from the Scottish Government. Uh, after we've taken evidence uh, on the instrument, we will debate the motion in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, item 3. Officials, of course, are not permitted to take part or contribute in that formal debate. Uh, and can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make some opening remarks? Okay, uh, good morning, convener. Good morning, committee. Uh, I intend to make a, a brief statement relating to the draft Post 16 Education Scotland Act 2013 modification of legislation order um, before taking some questions. Then, as arranged, Ms. McLeod will offer a second statement on draft aftercare eligible needs Scotland order and the draft continuing care Scotland order, and will take your questions accordingly. Uh, this order that I'm speaking to this morning, convener, is modest in its ambition. Uh, it essentially tidies up some legislation, largely as a part of the implementation of the Post-16 Scotland Act 2013. But it is important that it supports uh, our reforms of the Post-16 education sector. So, in summary, it would do four things. Uh, firstly, it would change some references in legislation to ensure that they continue to apply to publicly funded colleges and universities. And by that I simply mean colleges and universities that receive funding under the Further and Higher Education Scotland Act 2005. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, secondly, the order would align the financial year of a regional board uh, with that of an incorporated college. Uh, this change is prompted by a late but nevertheless welcome derogation by Her Majesty's Treasury that enables an incorporated college and a regional board to have a financial year uh, that matches the college's uh, academic year of August to July. Thirdly, it would update two orders, the Protection of Charities Assets Exemption Scotland Order 2006 and the Charity Test Specified Bodies Scotland Order 2008, so that they list the governing bodies of relevant colleges and universities. The first is relevant to publicly funded colleges and universities that are charities, and the second is uh, relevant to incorporated colleges. And fourthly, it would fix a few snags in the drafting of certain provisions in the Further and Higher Education Acts of 1992 and 2005 as amended by the Post-16 Education Scotland Act 2013. So, taking each of these in turn, the order would uh, insert a definition of recognised as in unions recognised by a college for collective bargaining purposes and variations of the word. It would remove a potentially confusing reference to principal in the list of people who are not eligible to be chair of a regional college and a specific exclusion in this regard is unnecessary. The legislation lists the chair and principal as separate members of the board and this means that they can't be the same person. It gives ministers the power to appoint a person in place of an assigned incorporated college chair in circumstances where ministers are required to remove them from office. 
Uh, this is relevant where such a person is also a member of another uh, college sector board and they are removed from that other board because of a board failure on that other board. In such circumstances, if they were a non-executive member rather than a chair of the assigned college board, uh, ministers could appoint someone in their place. So the current lack of provision is simply anomalous. It would also remove any doubt that directions by a regional strategic body cannot be given in relation to the transfer of any staff property rights of obligations. And that is what section 23N 7A of the Further and Higher Education Scotland Act 2005 sought to do. And it would ensure that directions under section 23N 3 of the Act could not be given to a college to transfer any staff, etc., or receive any staff, etc., from a transfer. So thank you, convener, and myself or my officials will be uh, glad to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Do any members wish to ask any questions, make any points, comments? Nope. Okay, we'll move on then. Um, uh, as indicated, we will now move to the formal debate on the instrument, which is item three on our agenda. Can I, can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak and to move the motion? Uh, move the motion. Uh, thank you. Uh, any contributions from members at this stage? No? Nope. Okay. Um, can I put the question then that motion S4M12539 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and officials for attending this morning? Um, and I'll suspend very briefly to allow a witness changeover. Thank you. Our next item is to take evidence on one negative instrument and two affirmative instruments, as noted on the agenda. Can I welcome Fiona MacLeod, the Acting Minister for Children and Young People, and our supporting officials from the Scottish Government. Um, after we have taken evidence on the instruments, we will debate the motions uh, for the affirmative instrument at item 5 and consider the negative instrument at item 6. Officials, of course, are not permitted to contribute to the formal debate on the affirmative instruments. Um, but now can I invite the Minister to make some opening remarks? Minister. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Good morning, committee members. Uh, I'm happy to make what I have to say will be a detailed statement, given the importance and concern relating to the draft aftercare eligible needs Scotland order, the related support and assistance of young people leaving Care Scotland Amendment Regulation 2015, and the draft continuing Care Scotland order before taking any questions. As the committee will be aware, our overall policy objective in all these instruments is to offer appropriate support to eligible care leavers in order to achieve a more measured transition out of care, encouraging preventative measures rather than crisis responses. And I seek your support for all three instruments. If I turn to the aftercare order first, convener. Under changes made to section 29 of the Children's Act 1995 by section 66 of the Children and Young People Act 2014, a local authority must assess a young care leaver to establish if they have eligible needs that cannot be met elsewhere. If the local authority is so satisfied, the new section 29 5AA places the local authority under a duty to provide such advice, guidance and assistance 
as it considers appropriate to meet those needs. This aftercare order crucially specifies the types of support that constitute eligible needs. Now, during the consultation on this instrument, a range of insightful views were offered by the sector and care leavers themselves on what categories of care and support were most desirable. As a result, you will see this instrument specifies eligible needs in such a way as allows local authorities to of offer an appropriate level of support to meet specific needs of individual care leavers and defines, defines that support in such a way as to be clear and meaningful to the young people themselves. The committee will be aware that during the consultation we proposed that the new ministerial powers in section 291B of the Children Act 1995 as inserted by section 662A2 of the 2014 Act could be used to extend eligibility for aftercare support to a further category of young care leavers. That is, those between their 11th and 16th birthdays who had been looked after for at least two years. That reflected unfinished policy discussion during the bill process and was included to illustrate one of the many possible categories who could be made eligible for aftercare services. Now, following consideration of the consultation responses, it was clear that the provision as described needed a lot more work with partners, providers and stakeholders, so this was removed from the draft order. Now, I don't want you to think that this removal to be seen as anything other than a, a desire to achieve a realisable extension of this support. Now, I understand that the committee has concerns, so let me reassure you in this regard. But I must be clear what will happen if we don't uh, uh, pursue this order today. Firstly, if we do not have the order in place, there will be no provision for the types of support that constitute eligible needs for the purposes of the new section 295 AA of the 1995 Act. This definition is a crucial part of the jigsaw to enable the amendments to section 29 of the 1995 Act made by section 66 of the 2014 Act to work effectively. As such, without that definition of eligible needs, we would not be able to properly implement and give full effect as Parliament intended to the amendments to section 29 of the 1995 Act made by section 66 of the 2014 Act. I know, convener, it's quite technical, but I think it's really important to get on the record why these statutory instruments are important today. So commencement of that provision would need to be delayed from the 1st of April. If we don't agree the SSI today, we would have to amend the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 Commencement No. 7 Order 2015 to remove the provision in that order which brings Section 66 into force on the 1st of April. This would mean, for example, that the upper age limit to support care leavers up to the age of 26 would not com commence on the 1st of April this year as planned. Now, I'm sure that no one who has been involved in any part of the development of these policies wants this to happen. So let me offer some reassurance around the order-making powers that I mentioned in section 66 of the Act. On the 14th of January last year, Aileen Campbell, the Minister, reiterated her announcement of the 6th of January, describing the Scottish Government's commitment to, and I quote, a number of measures to support care leavers. At the same time, she saw order-making powers to extend those types of support to further cohorts of formerly looked after children through secondary legislation. And being the librarian I am, I can reference you to column 3319 in the official report of the Stage 2 debate at, at committee. Can I absolutely assure you that that commitment still stands? And in fact, you may be aware that those powers are already in force and available to me as the Minister to exercise by virtue of provision made in the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 Commencement No. 1 and Transitory Provisions Order 2014. So, towards that, I commit to establishing the Expert Working Group next month. This will look at defining additional cohorts of young people eligible for aftercare. 
It will also bring together all stakeholders to map the resource and operational requirements of any extensions. And also, further, the expert working group will also look at return to care. Developing these policies will be a massive undertaking as both require flexibility and consideration of capacity within the system, as well as the financial climate, but we are all aiming for the same positive outcomes for our young care leavers. If I could turn briefly to the support and assistance of young people leaving care Scotland Amendment Regulation 2015 as they go together, this is a negative instrument for the committee today and is also related to aftercare support. The regulations make a number of necessary technical consequential amendments to the support and assistance of young people leaving care Scotland regulations 2003 in light of the amendments made to section 29 of the 1995 Act by section 66 of the 2014 Act. And I understand that Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee had no comment to make on this negative instrument. At this Point convener, would it help to pause and take questions on the aftercare order, or do you want me to continue and talk about the continuing care order? I think. I mean, I think we we'd ag we had a discussion beforehand, Minister, and I think we'd rather you continue the whole thing. We'll try and have a discussion because although they are different orders, um, they all cover roughly the same area of policy. So I think it'd be easier if we did it as a one. Okay. So turning to the continuing care order. The right to continuing care will apply to all young people in foster, kinship or residential care who were born after the 1st of April 1999, who ceased to be looked after by a local authority after the 1st of April 2015, subject to some statutory exceptions. At this point, those young people will have already developed to a stage where the children's hearing is satisfied that compulsory measures can safely be lifted. We have to respect the role of the panel members in this regard. So the default assumption is that continuing care is going to be a good thing for that young person and the day-to-day -day experience in continuing care ought to reflect what was in place while they were looked after. The overall aim here is to help normalise the experience for young care leavers and future orders will extend the upper age limit annually to guarantee this initial cohort is eligible until their 21st birthday. As part of our essential need to evidence decision making and inform future policy making, this instrument describes an assessment process which complements in existing regulations relating to aftercare support. Therefore, it is familiar to young care leavers and local authorities. The existing regulations are the support and assistance of young people leaving care Scotland regulations 2003-608. The order we have before us today was redrafted following the consultation to make sure the assessment better reflects issues of importance to young people, covering such as their relationships, their personal identity and their life story. Now, I'm aware of concerns expressed in relation to this order regarding thresholds. However, I do not accept that the threshold has been lowered by this order. The threshold that all local authorities will have to consider when determining if continuing care should either not be provided or cease to be provided is set down in new section 26A5C and 7C of the Children Act 1995. That is, that the care would, quote, significantly adversely affect the welfare of the person. And this order does nothing to change that. The list of matters to be considered by the local authority in the schedule are designed to build up a detailed picture of the young person and their life, which, together with the other views gathered by virtue of Article 7 of the order, not least those of the young person themselves, will assist a local authority in considering whether providing or continuing to provide continuing care would, and again, I say, significantly adversely affect the welfare of the person. This is the high threshold set down in Section 26A of the 1995 Act. I strongly believe that it could only ever be in exceptional circumstances that anything described or offered as continuing care could significantly adversely affect the welfare of the young person. We will make this exception clear in the guidance that is currently being consulted on and will supplement these provisions. Again, if this order is not commenced today, as of the 1st of April, 
there would be no right to continuing care. So in conclusion, convener, many care leavers quite understandably require support over a prolonged period, and I don't, do not believe that anywhere else in the world seeks the views and prioritises the needs of our young children and young people the way that we do in Scotland. I have absolute confidence in our care sector and wider workforce who had a crucial role in developing these outstanding policies to continue to have a truly positive impact on the lives of our children and young people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, and, and I'm sure the committee appreciates why it had to be so detailed um, a, a, a statement from yourself. Um, I'm now going to move to invite members for any, if they have any questions or comments they wish to make. Uh, Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener, good morning, Minister. Um, I, I think, first of all, I would have to put on record um, a welcome for the fact that a compromise has been reached. I, I think having received the email at 12 minutes past nine this morning, it could justifiably uh, be termed an 11th hour uh, compromise. But I, I think equally it's only fair to point out that I am not at all happy uh, with what was initially proposed, nor indeed the way that it has been proposed. I think you're right to point out the, the implications of not passing the orders um, with the commencement date of 1st of April. But in a sense, um, those of us who had concerns about what was presented to us, um, I think we'd be justified in thinking uh, that we've had a, a gun put to our head. The Children and Young People's Act was an act on which there wasn't necessarily uniform agreement across the board. But I think where we were in absolute lockstep with the Scottish Government was in the area of improvements to the treatment of and, and support for, for those going through the, the care system. I think this was um, certainly built upon uh, some compelling evidence we got from the coalition, from Who Cares Scotland, Bernardo's Aberlour, but particularly actually from the evidence we got from young care leavers uh, themselves. Now, I think we have been rightly congratulating ourselves ever since uh, on, on that aspect of the bill, uh, or the Act in particular, and we, we had assumed, I think, that um, the, the, the letter and indeed the spirit of that legislation would be honoured going uh, forward. Now, I appreciate you are new to this rule, um, ultimately the, 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 the buck stops with you, but I, I have to say I don't think you've been well served by those advising you, um, and, and that is why we're in uh, the situation we're in, and, and, and we've gone through the contortions we have over uh, recent uh, days. I think turning to the specifics, the negative instrument seems fairly straightforward, but in relation to the uh, instrument on uh, continuing care, I hear what you're saying about the, the threshold not having effectively been uh, lowered. Um, I find that difficult to understand. I mean, under uh, the Children and Young People Act, um, Part 2, Section 27, 7, uh, the duty to provide continuing care ceases if the person leaves the accommodation of the person's own volition, the accommodation ceases to be available, or the local authority considers that continuing to provide the care would significantly adversely affect the welfare of the person. Now, uh, there seem to be a range of options there. Now, I, I, again, I've heard what you've said, but at the very least, um, the schedule that has been attached to this order um, muddies the water somewhat and, and does seem to talk about issues that are, are certainly of well-being but aren't, uh, I would argue, um, strictly of, of welfare. Um, the, the, the issue of uh, the, the eligible person's future plans for study, training or work, the eligible person's general health, including any mental health issues. Uh, these are, are factors to do with, with, with well-being, to my, to my mind, rather than welfare. And as uh, I think Aberlauer and Bernardo's and Blue Care state in their briefing, the order should in fact make very clear that the threshold for removing a care leaver from a placement that they want to stay in must be, for example, what their health and emotional and mental welfare is being significantly adversely affected, not simply that they have health and emotional and mental well-being issues uh, that are not being uh, met. So I, I, I'll look forward to the work that's done to, to, to clarify that. But as I say, I think at, at the very least what it's done is muddy the, uh, the waters. I think turning to the, the issue... Minister, come in. There's, there's, lots, there's a lot of stuff you've covered already. I'll bring point, you back okay. in, but I mean, let's, point, yeah. let's hear yeah. from Minister. I, I, just, I just go back to, and it was why um, in my opening remarks, I tracked us back through all the different stages of legislation. Um, because it's about the significantly adversely effect. That hasn't changed. So that goes through absolutely everything. So whenever any decision would come to be made, it would have to show that staying in care significantly adversely affected the young person. And, you know, I can't think of many situations where that would be, but that's where that phrase 
runs through today and back to when it was first. That's what the you know this is set out to mm. ensure that that is always there. I think that's a, it's a helpful clarification. Um, I, I think what you're able to read on the record um, today, in addition to, to, to what we have before us, um, as a combination, I, I, again, will be helpful in interpreting it. But as I say, I, 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 I think there was a problem in the way that the order was presented um, that, that, that gave rise to uh, uh, concerns that what we were seeing was a dilution, that, that what we weren't looking at were situations where for example, there may be a manipulative uh, relationship between um, the, uh, the, the eligible person and, and whoever was providing care and that we needed local authorities to have the power in order to intervene. Um, what, what, what looked like being um, created as a result of this order was something uh, less than that. And I think given the advances in the continuation of care that are being delivered through this Act, um, the, the, the perverse incentive on local authorities to, 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 to potentially exploit that uh, was one that uh, I think gave rise to legitimate concern. If I could turn to no, the... No, sorry, I'm sorry. Before, before you move on, other members want on this specific point... Uh, we're bundling it all together. Right, fine. Yes, okay. just, yeah. I welcome back to you. It's just on this yeah. very specific okay. point about point. Uh, you've just raised, uh, Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. You know, it, it is very much on the specific point. At the time of the uh, Children and Young People's uh, uh, Bill going through this Parliament, we debated in great detail about the definitions of welfare uh, and of well-being. And at the time, some of the witnesses presented a case to us that it was very much easier to define welfare because it is embedded in a lot of other legislation. Well-being uh, was slightly less well-defined. And I entirely agree with the point that Mr MacArthur is making, that if you don't have uh, a specific definition for well-being, it is very easy for a misinterpretation of it. And I think the very genuine concern uh, that has been given to us just now is that because of that uh, slightly amorphous definition, we're in a situation where local authorities are not entirely sure what they're doing and might use that as an excuse not to provide the care that I think everybody believes is the intention of that. Would you accept that this problem between defining welfare and well-being is a problem and it's one of the ones that's got the Scottish Government into difficulty? I've got sort of two, two responses to that, um, Ms Smith. Can we look at welfare and well-being under the, the, the general um, getting it right for every child, which is what the, the Act embeds? Uh -huh. So I think we have to, local authorities, all of us have to think about everything we're doing under, under that title. But also we are out and working just now on non-statutory guidance to go with these instruments. Um, so it will be absolutely clear in the guidance what is meant by the difference, you know, if there is a difference between welfare and well-being. But, but forgive me, Minister, there is, a, there is a difference between guidance and the statutory responsibilities. And I think the concern at the moment is that the local authorities um, are obviously interested in what they can do on a statutory basis. And they're up against, you know, very significant financial difficulties just now. And I think the real concern that's been put uh, quite properly by the uh, Continuing Care co Coalition is that it's too easy for them to slip out of their responsibilities unless these definitions are tight. I think that's the main issue. OK. There's, their statutory responsibility, I take us back to, is it, they can only remove a child from care if continuing in care would be significantly affect the that's young not person. Right. That's not right. Significantly adversely affect. That's the statutory position tracked through all the legislation that I've outlined today. So that's the statutory position. We then move on to the fact that there will be guidance to ensure that they understand what we mean by well-being, and all of that is within the context of GERFEC. Can I follow this up? Because clearly it was a, it is a concern of the committee, and it has been raised with us by uh, the coalition. Um, and it is something I'm sure that those of us who are on the committee remember in great detail uh, the discussions we had. It does say, Minister, in the Act that the, uh, our local authorities' duty to provide continuing care last subject to subsection 7 below. The duty to provide continuing care ceases if A, B and C, C being the one you've, we've just been talking about, the local authority considers that continuing to provide the care would significantly adversely affect the welfare of the person. I think we all thought we understood what that meant at the time that we passed it. Um, the concern is not what it says on, in, in the Act, but what the interpretation of what it says in the Act is. So our concern is, you know, could you give us an example um, of you know, what that means in, in our real-life example? 
because our concern, I think, I mean, and I don't want to speak to it for other members of the committee, but our concern effectively is, you know, how would, would it be possible for some, a young person to have be removed from continuing care placements on the basis of an interpretation by, for example, a local authority about particularly 7C, what actually a significant adverse effect on welfare actually means? You need to turn to the schedule. Um, the matters to be considered in a welfare assessment. So we're talking about um, the young person, the emotional state, their day-to-day -day activities, their personal safety. It's all there in, in the schedule at the, at the end of the order. Could you, could you point to exactly whereabouts in the schedule you were talking about? Uh, it's all of it, is it? Yes, schedule one, the eligible person's emotional state, two, the person's family relationships, three, general health, Four, schooling. Five, future plans. Accommodation at six. Seven, sources of income. I'm, I'm trying to consider, I'm trying to actually understand um, what the relationship between this schedule is and this part of the Act, Minister. Um, I, I, if these are the matters to be considered in welfare assessment under the schedule you've just read out. Is that is that for entrance into care? No, this is matters to be considered in the welfare assessment. So, so Liam, did you want to come in there? I, right, am I getting confused? I thought I, I thought I was I, I thought I was being reassured there, but but actually. Um, on the back of, of your question, convener, um, I'm now reconcerned uh, about the the, uh, the matters that will be taken into consider consideration when making a welfare assessment. I mean, frankly, the, the eligible person's future plans for study, training, or work. Nobody knows teenagers go through a bit of a funk from time to time. I mean, is a welfare assessment going to um, be triggered um, and, and, and the elements of, of uh, 7C that the convener referred to on the basis that the plans for future study, training or work may not be uh, all that uh, the, the local authority officials uh, would have them aspire to. I, I think this is the real concern, that we understand the, the clarity of the, the provision in the Act is one that were well understood. And I think we also appreciated that there would be secondary legislation flowing from this in order to kind of detail out um, the, 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 the way in which this would be implemented. But at the very least, and I get back to the point I was making before, um, th there appears to be um, scope for a dilution of that uh, uh, assessment and the trigger for 7C um, through the, the, the provisions of the schedule here. And as Ms Smith was, was rightly pointing out, with, with local authorities under some financial pressure, the last thing we want to be doing is putting in incentives for them to make a decision um, that could have long-term life-changing uh, ramifications for the individuals we're trying to serve through this Act. Sorry, I'm not... <laughs> what am I being asked? Sorry, Liam, could you maybe clarify for the Minister? Well, I, well I, as I say, I thought I was, I thought I was reassured, reassured earlier on, um, given, uh, given the, 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 the statements about the fact that 7C and the, um, the significant adverse effect on welfare being the provision. But, but what you've described again it, it has brought in um, the, the, the provisions set out in, in the schedule, which includes such things as the eligible person's future plans for study, training or work, um, the eligible person's schooling skills and experience, a whole series of things that, that frankly do look like they're taking the threshold uh, for that intervention down to one of well-being rather than uh, of welfare. No, because it always goes back to if significantly adversely affects. You know, you will continue in care unless continuing in care would significantly adversely affect your welfare. I think That's it, the bottom line. I think this is one what of those... What we've tried to do in the schedule is to make it clear enough and in language that the young person themselves can understand so that they can get involved in their welfare assessment. As I said before, I, th I think the, the problem is that this is secondary legislation that is um, intended to try and help and amplify, but has actually ended up raising concerns because of the way in which it could be interpreted. I think that's the, the, that is the, the concern. But. Mm -hmm. um, I've got Siobhan and then Liz Smith. 
Thank you. Um, I mean, I agree with every comment that, that committee members have made, um, especially the timing of this. Um, we're given a week now, um, and if it's not passed, then people don't get what they require. Um, I think that's um, poor taste, frankly, to bring to the committee at this stage. However, on the welfare assessment, I think it's, it is diluting it, and I think the confusion comes where there isn't any examples, and so it's up to interpretation on what a young person's plan is, for instance, for future plans for study, training or work. Is that just about maybe going to college or is it the course that they have to be in or how long they've been there or how detailed does this plan have to be? And if each and every local authority interpret in a different way, then of course the well-being of that young person or child is going to be adversely affected. But at no point are we giving any examples of what that might be or clear framework. And it goes back to Liz Smith's point. You cannot just have that in guidelines that are going to come into force after the 1st of April, whereas this is passed now. And so will come into effect, if that is the case, if the committee vote on it, come into effect on the 1st of April, affect a young person's lives from that very day. But guidelines will not be issued because you said you're still consulting on it with whoever to make that happen, I think that's unacceptable. And this is where the confusion arises, where there are no examples whatsoever in one to eight of what that means. And I'll finish on point eight. The eligible person's knowledge of their rights and legal entitlements, any previous or current involvement in legal proceedings, including criminal proceedings as a victim, witness or alleged perpetrator. What does that mean? I don't know what that means. Does that mean that they understand what court is or their legal responsibilities to that? That isn't clear to it to me and I don't understand why that would be clear to a young person and you've said numerous times now in evidence this is about the young person and knowing their rights and responsibilities. I don't think that clears it up for us, never mind the young person. Okay. Yeah, one thing I think it's important to say that I don't if, in asking for examples, I don't think legislation is the place to put examples in. Um that's not how legislation works, but I'll I'll turn to um legal officer for that. Um the examples will be worked through in the guidelines, and the guidelines are out. We're working on that, and everybody's involved. Um, another official can, off the top of my head, COSLA, local authorities, young people themselves, the care inspector are all involved in working on these guidelines. But perhaps if I can turn to Mr McGlashan on the topic of what you can and can't put in legislation. Um. Well, I mean, if I can clarify uh, the Minister's points about the matters in, in the schedule, they are actually quite similar to existing regulations uh, related to aftercare in 2003. Um, and, you know, they, they are part of the picture that, um, that, that forms the welfare assessment. Other matters in uh, Article 7 of the order um, include um, the, the, wealth, the local authority seeking and having regard to the views of the eligible person and they may also um, seek the views of, of other people, um, parents of the eligible person, those that have parental responsibilities for the young person, education professionals and the, the, the young person's carer. So the, the matters in the schedule are, are part of the, the general picture that's built up around the young person in order um, that the local authority can then assess whether the high threshold that's set down in the 2014 Act is, is met or not. So it's, it's all part of a, an assessment process to allow the, the local authority to consider whether uh, providing continuing care or continuing to provide it will significantly adversely affect the young person. Uh, I think we understand that. It's, a, it's about the way and, and what's put in it. Um, and I accept the point, you can't put everything in legislation, but considering, as I said, you're still working on the guidelines and you wish this order to be passed in order to be in effect next Wednesday, I think that's a real concern for us all sitting around this table. Just in, in response to that, can I say that under the order making powers that I've explained earlier and the fact that we're going to set up the expert working group, I'm absolutely open to, I'm confident sitting here today that this is the right thing to do, but if once we put these into into practice, if there's any suggestion that they're not working in the way that I think they will work, then I've got the power to be able to review it and bring back amendments to you. And I, and I give you that commitment that I will do that if that is necessary. But I am convinced that what we're looking at today is the right thing to do. That's, that's very 
So just before I bring in Liz Smith, can I just clarify one thing? You mentioned that you were currently um, uh, consulting on guidelines. Could you tell us what those gu which guidelines you're consulting on and who you're consulting with? Guidelines for, for both the orders before us today and, as I've said off the top of my head, but can I turn to make sure I've got the, who we're consulting with right? Um, there's non-statutory guidance on the aftercare um, order and the continuing care order. At the moment, they're two separate documents, but they're very closely linked. They are um, going through a, a, an active consultation, not in the way that the statutory guidance did, which was online with um, um, for, for corporate parenting, which is online for, uh, um, for responses. We're doing it as a, kind of a live, iterative drafting process. And um, it's much more important for us to, to get the guidance right. And I accept that it won't be it won't be in place on the first of April. Asking who, who are you? Oh, sorry. Okay. Yes, uh, um, we're consulting with the um, the sector, the service providers. We have a series of we've had a series, and we continue to have another series of events planned, which will bring in local authorities. Um, yes, COSLA. The, Care Inspectorate, which the Minister um, mentioned. We also have a series of events for um, for young people and care leavers, and we will, um, if they haven't already, invitations haven't already issued, then they're due to issue for events in May for including the Scottish Through Care and After Care um, um, Forum, sorry, and um, Who Care Scotland, obviously, are our key, our key uh, contacts. No, I'm slightly concerned. Let, let me just clarify this. Um, the Minister said that you are currently um, carrying out consultation on non-statutory guidelines. I've just asked you who you're uh, currently consulting with, and right at the very end there, you said that you will be inviting, which is future tense, um, uh, members who I think are members of the coalition that we're talking, that have been involved in the bill all the way through, very active members like Barnardo's, etc. So uh, are you saying that you've currently met with and have been currently consulting with Barnardo's and, uh, and the other members of the Continuing Care Coalition, or that is something you intend to do in the future? It's a combination of both, but we haven't we haven't met them formally around a table to discuss all aspects of this. But we did receive quite a lot of feedback on um, the content of the guidance as part of the consultation on the uh, on the on the draft instruments, so that we used the evidence the base. Instruments. The draft instruments one consultation. The consultation oh, yes, on non-statutory guidelines is something else. Yes. I'm just I'm not trying to be difficult, but I'm just trying to make sure that we are all clear about this. Mm -hmm. um, have the coalition, um, Continuing Care Coalition, been involved in the uh, non-statutory guidelines co consultation that was mentioned by the Minister? No, not yet. No. So they haven't been involved They haven't in seen the document, no. It's right. ongoing. It's an ongoing consultation. Uh, well, well, I'm sorry, that opens up more sorry. questions that, that, that I have okay. now. Okay. Can I, can I, one, of the, one of the groups that we, we perhaps should have on the record that we have consulted with, if I'm correct, is Celsius. Um, well, Celsius are a crucial part of drafting the regulations. Uh, yeah. Sorry, the guidance, yes. Yeah. Uh, Celsius, in fact, I'm meeting them this afternoon to go through both documents. When did the consultation start? When does it end? And at what point do the coalition members get involved in it? Um, the consultation's been ongoing since um, autumn, um, since the end of, of last year. But it's, a, as I say, it's not a... It's not been a formal consultation because it's a non-statutory. They're, they're both non-statutory. We've been doing them much more as an iterative development process because, it, particularly on continuing care, we were starting from effectively a, a blank canvas and building on on existing um, processes for for aftercare. And my, the, the right. other part of my question was, when does it conclude and when do they get involved? Um, we'd like it to be concluded in April so that we can publish the the papers, but. It's more important for us, with the group that we're talking to, to make sure that the, the guidance is, is absolutely perfect. I, th I think at this stage, convener, I'm, I'm quite happy to be able to say to the committee that I will make sure that all the relevant bodies are brought in within the next few weeks and we sit down and we work on this with urgency. Well, I'm, welcome, I'm, I'm very much welcome what you've just said, Minister, but I am genuinely now concerned... I was concerned about other things. I'm now genuinely concerned that what I've just heard is that a, a non-statutory guidelines consultation started in the autumn, is due to finish in April, which is about a week away. Um, even if it's the end of April, it's only a month away. Um, and the continuing care for coalition who have been heavily involved in this committee's work and the process of the bill have not yet been spoken to. Yeah, part I'm, of the consultation. I'm more Can than you happy. understand the concerns yes, that we have? absolutely, convener, and I will reiterate that 
I will leave here and make something happen. Okay, thank you very much, Minister. Liz Smith. Thank you. Um, I think, Minister, if I can just set it in context, I think nobody in this room um, is not aware of the crucial need to ensure that we're doing the best for the young people and the carers involved. That that's absolutely goes without saying. And I don't think anybody uh, is in any way uh, has a problem with the uh, intentions of the Act. Let me be absolutely clear about that. Where I think there is a very significant problem, I think it's just been amplified this morning, is that when it comes to uh, the definition of welfare, it is an easier one to pick up because it has a long-established definition within other legislation. The well-being one is not nearly so easy. And these uh, schedules which intimate some of the uh, welfare assessments, to be quite frank, they're woolly. That they don't give the specific guidance that is required to make sure that local authorities and any other bodies involved understand what the interpretation is. And that's the point that the uh, convener was making earlier. There is an interpretation issue here. And, you know, the questioning over the last uh, few minutes has just amplified that, you know, the, the actual consultation process um, at best, I think, has been uh, rather spasmodic. And we're, we're, you're asking the committee this morning to vote on something where I don't think the complete information is available. Okay. Uh, and, and that's quite a serious issue, Minister. I, w I would take you back to, uh, and, and I must emphasise, I am confident that these two orders do what they say they'll do. I'm absolutely certain that they go ahead on the 1st of April. I'm absolutely certain that, for instance, the... Um, significantly adversely affects condition runs through everything we do therefore as of the 1st of April you can't, local authorities can't suddenly have a different way of looking at whether a child should continue in care or not it must be about significantly adversely affecting the young person so I'm confident that that will happen that these are the right things to do on the 1st of April but I'm also happy to make the commitment to the committee that I will go away from here today and speed things up in terms of bringing everybody together to make sure that the guidelines that go out are understandable to everybody. Okay, Chick Brody. Yes, good morning. morning. Given the last question and given the fact that you know, we have your commitment, Minister, which is, which is very welcome, but the fact is that we're going to put something together very quickly uh, how are you going to ensure that there is consistent application of the guidance? And what happens if there isn't? But there Across all local authorities, right. so they're all consistent. There, there has to be consistent application know, of the orders. But, but how there are we going to ensure be Because they're legal orders. And in statute, it tracks back through different acts, 2014, 1995, etc., different regulations, it tracks back. These, aren't, these orders today aren't orders in isolation. They grow out of previous legislation, previous guidelines, previous guidance. So there will be, or there should be, consistent application because that's what the law is. What I'm saying today is that we will make sure that the guidelines that go around it make it clear what that means. No, I, I welcome that, and, and certainly there should be. But I think it's very important, and given your commitment today, which, as I say, is welcome. Can I, we can I just pick up on one thing? Sorry, Mr Brodie. You yeah. said that you know my commitment today will mean that we'll quickly cobble together or put together something. As, as the official has said, we've been working on this for many months, so it's not about quickly putting it together, but it's about quickly making sure that everything that we're working on comes together in one place. Well, maybe I misunderstood. I thought that we were, and we've been working on it, but you know, we're talking about ten days, uh, not even ten days, eight days. And are the guidelines? Are the guidelines? You haven't talked to the coalition. Are the guidelines quite clear, explicit, so that local authorities clearly understand uh, what's expected of them? I don't think I said I could do that within eight days, but I will make sure that everything that we've been working on comes together, and that everybody that needs to be involved is involved. Okay, thank you. Mary Scanlon. Convener, 
I'm actually um, grateful to my colleague Liz Smith because she sat through the committee obviously hearing the evidence and uh, I came on the committee at the end of the evidence uh, session. Uh, I have to say but I have been around this place for quite a long time and I'm sitting here with a heavy heart and I really do feel that as Liam MacArthur said we're, we are having a gun put to our head today. Yep. I do not feel confident in <laughs> Uh, putting this forward uh, and can I just say that I had hoped convener that we would get clarity today I have listened carefully I've listened to all the questions but more importantly I've listened to all the answers and instead of clarity I've actually got more confusion and what really concerns me is that the continuing care order they tell us that they've consulted COSLA, all the local authorities, Aberlour Trust, Bernardo's, Who Cares, etc. Well, you know, I don't know about COSLA, etc., but we have a letter, 12 minutes past nine this morning, from the Continuing Care Coalition, and I have to say two of the members from Aberlour and Bernardo's are in the audience uh, today, and they remain concerned. You know, if they're concerned, and we've got no opportunity to go back to them mm -hmm. to say... Given that we know that you've not even been asked for your opinions, they've not even been consulted, we get a letter today saying they're concerned. I, I am very, sorry convener, I'm very uncomfortable about this. It may be good legislation, but the implementation is rubbish. It's rubbish. And can I just say it's taken a year for us to get into this model. It's taken a whole 12 months to be confused and muddled. We're getting further meetings. Minister's going to go away and going to talk to people. Well, that's great, because uh, there's not a lot going on in the past year. We're getting further meetings, more guidelines. We get people remaining concerned, asking for secondary legislation, and papers at 10 past nine this morning. Uh, so I want to put on record, I'm sorry, I've put a lot of legislation through this parliament this is cross-party, this is not party political. My colleague Liz Smith and I support every single piece of this legislation. What we've seen this morning is poor by all standards. And I did want clarity. I have an open mind on this. I want to be supportive. But I want the third sector who care about this to have a voice. And they don't have a voice. So I put it on record, I will probably abstain, it's the best I can do, <laughs> whatever happens, the majority in this committee is the majority, but hand on heart, this is not a good morning for legislation. Thank you very much, Ms Scanlon. I'll bring the Minister in to respond to that. If, if I can just respond to that, Ms, Ms Scanlon is saying that um, we haven't involved the third sector, we have the schedule that we're looking at uh, today um, as part of the order, the matters to be considered in the welfare assessment, that was consulted with the members of the coalition were part of that consultation. Thank, thank you for that, Minister. Uh, that, was, that was mostly, that was kicked off by uh, obviously Liam's question about the significant ad adverse impacts on welfare described the act, and I interrupted Liam at that point. I know you had other points you wish to make, so I'll come back to you. To the aftercare, is, that, fine, yeah. is that appropriate now? Yeah. I, I mean, I think there are some similarities. I think the, the point that a number of colleagues have made in relation to, to potentially creating adverse um, or perverse incentives uh, on, on local authorities with provisions that, that I think radically improve the provisions for uh, those going through the care system, which I, I think all, all members have uh, reconfirmed their, their sort of unswerving commitment towards. I think the concern uh, for those of us in considering um, the, the, the bill at the time in relation to aftercare was that um, at any stage when you pick a point in time, be it the 16th birthday in, in, in this instance, you create the, the potential for a cliff edge. And I think that was acknowledged by the, the Minister in, in the exchanges uh, with us. I think um, the, the, the coalition at the time uh, illustrated the fact by, by saying that if we weren't careful, you would have potentially uh, individuals in the care system for maybe 15 and a half years, then going out of the care system and not being eligible uh, for the, the, the aftercare simply because they weren't in care at the 16th birthday. But, but as we all know, um, individuals uh, wax and wane in terms of the support that they, that they need, and, and that's why these provisions were seen as so important. While at the same time, somebody who maybe three months ahead of their 16th birthday found themselves going into care, 
Korea would be eligible for under the, course of the, on, under the provisions of this Act is significant after, uh, after care uh, up to the 26th birthday. So I think there was a recognition there was a problem to resolve, but it was a problem that couldn't be resolved and the Act had to be resolved in the orders. And I think what we've seen here, and I note in the, in the, um, in the policy memo uh, coming with the, the order, uh, on the consultation, it suggests that um, in light of con uh, consultation responses, the draft provision, which would have extended eligibility for aftercare support to a further category of formerly looked after young people, is not being taken forward at this point in time until further evidence is gathered from the sector to ensure its deliverability. Now, I don't think any of us want to put in place something that is not deliverable. It may feel, make us feel good in the short term, but medium term, longer term, um, it is in, in, in no one's interest. I think what I'm struggling in terms of, of this order, which, which looks very, very different from um, the initial order that was consulted upon, which I think very much reflected the, the spirit as well as the letter of what we passed in the Act, is that there doesn't even seem to be an intimation of direction of travel. I, the, the, the coalition, Aberlour, Bernardos and Who Cares, have suggested even the, pro the prospect of tapering, such that you, you, you build it back from the 16th birthday to, to start off with those who are 15, 14, 13, 12, 11. So, so over time, what you, what you allow is a, is a settling down of these new provisions, which are, um, I think everybody would expect, um, a, a bit of a radical departure um, from what's there uh, before. But without even any sign of that tapering, well, I, I know there are, are, are assurances that have been given in the exchange of letters with the, the coalition about the work that will be done over the coming months. It, it would have been more helpful, I think, had there been a signal within the order that at least the government was moving in that direction rather than what appears to be the case, that it's kind of been left in the, in the too difficult box. And, and I'm, I'm sure you'll appreciate the position that puts the, the, the committee in. Um, I, I think, like others have, have, have indicated, Mary Scallon, for example, I, I'm hugely supportive of, of the, the Act. I think it's one of the crowning achievements of this committee, the way that we worked with um, stakeholders and with the government to deliver something that it will be a, 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 a massive improvement in terms of some of the most vulnerable in our, in our society. Uh, but I'm, I'm really concerned that at the point of implementation, we seem to be um, seeing the government um, stumbling in the way that it's uh, approaching this. I can't, uh, in all good conscience, vote for an, uh, for an order. I, I certainly won't stop it coming into, into being, because I think you've, you've articulated very well the consequences of that, uh, and therefore we propose abstaining. But I, I think, again, we put on record my, my real concern at both what we've present, been presented with and actually the way in which that has happened. Uh, I think we've managed to snatch from um, a victory uh, of the legislative process, um, uh, if not a defeat, then, then, then something that, that, that taints um, the, the sense of achievement we all felt. I think I, I would hope that, that that we can come out of this not feeling like that because like you, like this committee, even though I wasn't involved in it, I thought this was a, a fantastic piece of legislation. Um, what it does now and what it gives us the, the ability to do in the future for young people and especially care experienced young people is phenomenal. So I hope that we can move beyond this. Um, I quoted from the official record from when the minister was in front of the committee, and I and I, I wonder if there's been the, the 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 minister was absolutely clear that we would look at extending aftercare and continuing care to further cohorts of young people, but that would be over an extended period of time that we would look at this. So today I've given the commitment that the expert working group will start meeting in April to work on this, to look at it. We will look at the orders before us today will extend um, after uh, continuing care and after care upwards to perhaps 26 years of age if the young person needs it. So we are, this order is extending. We're talking about extending backwards to 11 to 16 year olds that have been in care, but no longer in care on their 16th birthday. When we went out to consultation, it was about what came back from the stakeholders, from the providers and everybody saying exactly what you've been talking about is how do we approach this? So, you know, I've, I've made the commitment today that the expert working group will meet in April and start working on a mapping exercise involving everybody because there's nothing worse than making the promise that we'll do something if we can't deliver it. So we have to yeah. make sure we get this right 
I, I mean, I, I appreciate that. I think the, the original draft of the order um, may have been um, an ask too far in terms of deliverability. And I think the, the, the Minister, Aileen Campbell, put on record that she was looking to do this um, over, over a period. And, and I, I wouldn't dispute that. What I think I'm concerned about is that th there doesn't appear to have been in this order the beginnings of the step towards that. Now, you, you set out a, a, a process whereby hopefully we will, uh, we will get to the point where that can be achieved. Uh, I think what I would be looking for on the basis that the, the committee is going to be left in a position of, 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 of passing these orders uh, or not today is a commitment in terms of the, the, the time frame for delivery of that and actually a commitment also um, to, for this committee to see sight of that. Um, if, if the idea is to put this in place by the end of the calendar year, then working back from that, we will need to see um, the text of that agreement, I think, in good time rather than something that, well, it's the beginning, it's the end of the year, it may lapse over into the into the new year. There's no great difficulty with that. Well, uh, there is, frankly, and um, I, I, I think with a, an election pending next year, uh, while that won't stop things coming um, to, to, to a halt entirely, I, I, I think it would be more than unfortunate, given given the position we're in at the moment, if we were to find ourselves um, desperately scrambling around to, to, to sign off things um, that, that really um, one would have hoped had been dealt with now. So it'd be, it would be useful to get a commit from, from, from from you today, Minister, about the time frame for, for, for coming back to the committee with revised uh, revised wording on, on, on an order um, that gives us some confidence that, that feet will be kept to the fire uh, once uh, once this committee session is ceased. I'm quite happy to. I mean, in, in, in both senses, um, I, as the Minister, will want to be involved and kept up to date on all the work that's going on with the expert working group. But I'm more than happy to make the commitment if the committee has room in its timetable to come back on a fairly regular basis to update you on where we are and how we're getting with it. And just to, to, un to finish that point is the commencement order number one that's already on the statute book will allow the minister to take forward orders when, when we've worked out exactly how you know, th this is feasible, practical and doable. To everybody's satisfaction. Well, well indeed, and, and, and I don't doubt there will be those um, resisting this, but I, I, I would be concerned that um, there will be those arguing that this is still too difficult and, and, and always will be too difficult. But, but actually the policy intent of the Act needs to be honoured and therefore those yeah. who are raising those objections at some point yeah. need to recognise that, that, that yeah. the will of this Parliament is to ensure that not just that we pass the Act but that we ensure the implementation of it in keeping with both the letter and the yeah. spirit of the Act. Yeah, but, and I think in the spirit of the Act is that the expert working group will get everybody around the table working together so that we all come to an agreement. Right. Okay. Can, I, can I just cl again clarify, I mean, are we talking, well, could you tell me, what is the time frame for bringing forward additional orders to extend the eligibility? When would you likely, when are we expecting to see those? The expert working group will convene in April. Mm -hmm. um, I will, I, I mean, this is a huge mapping exercise that we have to go through, but I'm happy to say that by the end of the year, I, I or the minister, will hopefully, if everything works out, be able to come and talk to you about it. The intention is to bring forward the orders by the end of the calendar year. I don't, th I don't think it would be right for me to say that in, before the expert working group starts the mapping exercise. But we have the ability under com commencement order number one to bring forward the orders whenever we're, re you know, it's, it's able to, we're able to do so. But that's your hope? I would hope so, okay. yeah. Liz Smith. Uh, just as a point of information, at, at the time where we uh, debated the bill, one of the concerns on this particular order was from COSLA as to whether there was sufficient funding and resources in place to allow this to go forward. Can the Scottish Government give a commitment that that is the case? We're just at the beginning of this process with the expert working group sitting down, um, so we need to map out and work out. I mean, I think we're talking about, is it um, 900 young people would be eligible for aftercare, how many would take it up, etc. So that will be part of the mapping exercise to ensure that finances are available. And at what stage might we get a commitment on that? As, as soon as we know the figures and I'm able to sit down and work it out. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'll take other questions, but I'm going to wrap this up now. I'm going to get one way. Yeah, Liam. It was in response to the, the responses you got, convener, to, to the question about the time frame. I, I mean, I don't doubt your commitment. I think part of the 
problem possibly has been that we've had a, a, a change of minister between the, the, the Act and the, and the implementing uh, orders. Uh, any working group will have the framework set for it in terms of, of, of the expectations of what it's to, to deliver. Um, I, I would be more comfortable were we to get something more than just a, a hope that the orders would be in place by the end of the year. As I say, once we get into 2016, um, with an election pending, we all know that minds start to, 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 to get focused on other things. But actually what we need to see by the end of, of, of this year are orders presented to, to this Parliament that command the agreement of the working group, but actually that the working group has begun its, its deliberations, sure and certain in the knowledge that, that what is expected is a set of orders by the end of the calendar year. Because the thing is, if it's remotely vague going in, you can be sure as eggs as eggs, somebody is going to um, find a way of, of running down the clock um, if they believe that this is, this is too difficult to achieve. Can I summarise, Convener? The expert working group will uh, begin in April. I will set a, a deadline of reporting to me timiously, but definitely by the end of this calendar year. And I will commit myself to keeping in touch with it on a regular basis and bringing um, updates to the committee as and when the committee requires it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just, I mean, uh, can I thank you for uh, your time on, on this, Minister? I think you'll understand the importance that the committee, um, uh, to, uh, re the reason we have spent so much time on this, given the background. Um, I, I can also thank you for your offer to come back to the committee um, and provide us with regular updates. Can I make um, an invite, hopefully on behalf of the committee, that you return to this committee before the end of April and you update us on the progress of the guidance? And the guidelines. That's that. The, the, we, I have concerns. I'm sure others do. Yep. So I'm sure it would be appropriate, um, if you don't mind, coming back before the end of April um, to discuss the guidance. Happy to. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, um, we now move to item five on our agenda, which is the formal debate on the two affirmative instruments just discussed. Can I invite the minister to speak to and move motion S4M 12540 on the continuing care Scotland order 2015? Formally moved. Thank you very much, Minister. Any contributions from members? I don't want to re I don't want to go back over what we've just done, but if, if anybody wants to make a very, very, very short comment, I'm quite happy to take it. Liam. Kavina, only to say, I think um, this, is a piece of this aspect of this piece of legislation is something uh, about which we all felt genuinely proud because of the way in which it, it came about. Um, it's prompted by an award-winning campaign from the, uh, uh, the, the, the coalition. Um, I, I would hope we can still retrieve what all of us hoped um, we could achieve through that, that legislation. But um, I, I think this hopefully has been a lesson to, uh, to, to you, Minister, and to your officials um, about um, the way in which you engage with this, this committee. We understand the deadlines that you're, you're working to in terms of commencement orders, um, but the assumption that we will simply be able to vote things through because we're right up against the commencement order, I think, um, has, uh, has not been helpful in terms of the relationship that, that this committee has with, uh, uh, with the Scottish Government. But as I say, I, I fully appreciate the position we're in. I won't be able to support the, 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 the orders, um, but um, neither will I uh, wish to see them, them fall. Um, but with that, I'll wrap up my remarks. Thank you. Okay. Any other members at this stage? Mary Scanlon. I just want to put on record that I am uh, supportive and my party is supportive of the legislation. I, I wish, do not wish to repeat what I've said before, but I am very disappointed at the lack of clarity that we've received today. And uh, I think the words kicking into the long grass is what comes to mind. Uh, I, I don't like this and I think really could do better comes to mind. By the end of the year, it's not good enough. They've already had 12 months. They also had years in consulting, preparing, looking forward to the legislation. You know, but a few years down the line, and we've still got another nine months to wait. I thank you, convener, for suggesting to come back to committee by the end of uh, April. I, I very much support that, and thank you for it. And I just want to explain to you why I will be abstaining today. This is not in any way an illustration that I do not favour this legislation. My party is supportive, and it's only due to the lack of clarity, clear information that we've received today that I will be abstaining on behalf of my party. Thank you, Mary. Uh, George Adam. Thank you, 
No, uh, I would just like to say along to what you've said and also what's been said by Liam that this was an important part of the work the committee has done and it was a perfect example of committees, in fact I think I'm on record as saying mm -hmm. it's a perfect example of uh, seeing how committees can uh, deal with legislation and influence it. I think for me I can see that there's actually uh, there's work that we've, we still need to get done. I am quite uh, happy with the idea that the Minister will be returning to come back to us again with the information and working with the third sector sector groups. I think there was uh, uh, some issues with uh, the coalition and I think we've got to the stage where the continuing care coalition are uh, not exactly static but they feel that they can actually work uh, with on the legislation again and I think that's the important thing because we still we don't want to be in a situation where we lose the important parts of this legislation and it is life changing literally life-changing legislation that we're talking about here. And I think we have to make sure that we, we take on board everything that's happened, but we are where we are and we have to deal with the situation but not lose the important parts that we know this legislation can do. And I think that's the thing we need to bear in mind when we're deciding where we're going to go forward. I will be going supporting uh, the, supporting what's in front of us at the moment and they look forward to working with the Minister and others to make sure that we make this work because that's the most important thing. It's not often we can say that we've got legislation that can change people's lives to the extent that we're talking about but that is what, exactly what this is and that's the bit we've got to remember. Yeah, thank you very much. Any other member at this stage? Um, I'll just add a short contribution myself. Can I, I thank those members who have spoken um, both in the, bit, the, the previous agenda item and in this one. I think the Minister you understand the, the concerns of the committee given the work um, we have done since, effectively since 2011 on looked after children and of course uh, moving on through our um, inquiries and indeed the, uh, the Children and Young Bill which eventually became the Act. So we, we do um, treat this matter in, uh, very seriously as I'm sure you understand as I'm sure the Government does as well. We obviously all have concerns, um, but I um, very much welcome your um, commitment to the work that's still to be done, and, and I very much welcome your commitment to coming back to the committee and keeping us part of the loop uh, and engaged in this process. So I also accept very much the fact that, uh, in a sense, this, the, the implications of not passing uh, these orders are uh, far greater than the, than the implications of passing them, if I can put it that way. And therefore, I, I will be voting in favour of it. Um, but it, that I still leave the caveat about my concerns about where we have process that we have undertaken and the position we have been left in. So I still have those concerns, but I, I fully accept that actually the commitments you have given and indeed the necessity for passing uh, these orders today. Um, so with that, um, I will uh, move on um, at, uh, yeah, and, and ask the Minister if she has any uh, uh, comments or responses she wants to make. Yeah. Only further to what we said before, can I just clarify that in, in producing the secondary legislation for you today, we have consulted widely, taken into consideration views that came back from stakeholders, and that's why the orders before you today are in the shape that they are. Yeah, thank you very much, Minister. Um, therefore, I'll now put the question uh, that motion S4M12540 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, we're not all agreed, therefore there will be a division. Um, can I ask for those who wish to support motion S4M12540 to show now? Okay. Uh, those against? And those who wish to abstain? Okay. Uh, on motion uh, 12540, there were five yes. Zero for no and four abstentions, uh, therefore uh, that is passed. Uh, can I invite the Minister therefore to speak to and move motion S4M12541 on the Aftercare Eligible Needs Scotland Order 2015? Formally moved. Thank you. Uh, do any members wish to make a contribution at this stage on this one? No? Okay. Uh, I'll just uh, move straight to the vote then. Uh, that motion S4M12541 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, we're not agreed, and therefore there will be a division um, on uh, motion S4M12541. Those who wish to vote yes, please show. Okay. Those against? Abstain? Uh, on motion uh, S4M12541, uh, uh, five for yes, 
no for no, none for no, I should say, and four abstentions. Uh, therefore, that motion is uh, passed. Uh, can I thank the Minister and officials for their attendance? Um, I ask you to just remain at the table uh, until we deal with the next item. Um, our next item is to consider a negative instrument as detailed on the agenda uh, and on which we took evidence at item four. Uh, do members have any comments on the instrument? Does the committee agree to make no recommendation to the Parliament on the instrument? That's agreed. Thank you very much. I will now suspend briefly. Uh, our next item is to continue our work on educational attainment uh, by discussing the role of the third sector and the private sector in improving attainment and achievement for all school pupils, uh, particularly those whose attainment is, is at the lowest level. Can I thank all those who provided us with written submissions? Uh, very interesting indeed they were. And can I welcome to the committee uh, Susan Quinn from the Educational Institute of Scotland, uh, Angela Morgan from Includem, David Watt from the Institute of Directors, Alan Watt from the Princess Trust Scotland and Susan Hunter from YouthLink Scotland. Um, we've got a 
reasonably big panel, so um, hopefully we can keep our questions and answers fairly brief. And can I apologise to the panel for keeping you waiting uh, over the previous item, but perhaps you have caught a, a flavour of why um, you've been kept a little bit uh, longer than you originally uh, expected to be. So apologies for that. Um, we have got about an hour to uh, deal with this particular item on the agenda. Uh, therefore, I'm going to go straight to questions from members. Um, and can I start with Mary Scanlon? Thank you. I have permission from the convener to refer to the Audit Scotland report. No, you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. It's on the paper. We agreed privately. Uh, right, just as, as an opening statement, um, uh, the Audit Scotland report, which very much focuses on attainment, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but uh, uh, some schools have achieved better attainment results and their level of deprivation would indicate suggesting the gap between lowest and highest performing schools cannot be wholly attributed to different levels of deprivation. So that's probably my first question. If it's not, uh, we all know that it's linked to deprivation, but it's not the only uh, issue. So if it's not all about deprivation, what else? My second point is really the probably my main concern and again, I quote, there has been no independent evaluation of how much councils spend on education and what this delivers in terms of improved attainment and wider achievement. So we're about to spend another £100 million of taxpayers' money. But according to Audit Scotland, there's no, we, we don't know the link between spending and attainment. So just on those two issues, if I could ask a response to kick us off from the panel. If you don't volunteer, I'll pick some days. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I can move on to the next question. Alan. Um, thank you very much, uh, convener. Uh, I think it was very interesting to note, not always linked to deprivation. For me, uh, when I talk to young people through Princess Trust Scotland, the thing that's most striking is a lack of aspiration and a lack of hope. Uh, and very often it's a belief that if they've missed out the first time round, uh, that chance won't come back. Uh, and I think that's very much brought home when you meet, for example, a 24-year-old who's moved on to an apprenticeship through one of our programmes who thought when they left school at 16 with no qualifications that that was it. So I think um, for, for me it's about uh, an environment, whether that's at school, at home, in college, wherever it is, that keeps saying to a young person, you know, you can progress, you can move on. So... Um, uh, in answer to that, that first question, uh, I think it's where you've got uh, teachers, um, youth workers, uh, organisations like the Princess Trust, like include them, um, who are able to give people that sort of desire, uh, you know, to move on to the next level. Uh, and you know, we see that uh, in all all sorts of different schools. It doesn't really matter. Um, in terms of the independent evaluation, um, I think obviously very hard for me to, to comment on the, the specifics of the, the latest uh, proposal. I haven't looked at that in a, a great deal of detail. Um, and I think we need to look at things in the round. It's not just about the education spend, it's about the wraparound support. I think that's a point that's made by a number of the, the written submissions. Uh, let's look at the investment in young people in, in total. Uh, and sometimes it's, um, let's think about it as an investment. Uh, so we, we can actually invest in young people uh, for a long-term future, and it will cost more money sometimes to, to get the right result. Sorry, it's not all about deprivation, and you know the education budget is a huge budget yeah. over 32 councils. 100 million over three years could very easily be absorbed, and we've got no way of measuring the spend and relating it to attainment. So it would be helpful, convener, if uh, the panel members could give us some indication as to where they feel the money would be best invested. Um, I'll let well, Alan think about it for that a second. Um, uh, Susan, from the EIS's point of view. The, from the EIS's point of view, the, the, the key to where the money needs to be spent is in, is in long term projects. The, the difficulty you have often is that, as I'm sure my colleagues will agree here, that projects start, they see some um, improvements. And then they spend either goes elsewhere or, or is prioritised elsewhere. And I think that's one of the challenges we face. We know that 20-something um, years ago when I started teaching that um, the likes of home link workers were, were key within um, areas of, of the city I work in. Um, and yet because they were an easy target when it came to, to budget cuts in, in the 80s. They, they were lost from the system 
And now we see that we're beginning to consider that actually those are areas where um, great improvement can be made. So I think that some of it is about how you you ma maintain projects over an extended period of time rather than looking for quick fixes. And if you're looking for that, then you, you go beyond it. In terms of the, um, if not all about deprivation, the, the then what else? It is about the, the, it's the aspects of deprivation and the, what is considered within that and the, the aspirations and the reason the aspirations of communities as well as the young people themselves within schools. It's not if, if you can't see a way out of poverty because there's, there's, there's more to it that within your own community, then you need to look at at that kind of to the, that side of it so you need to consider all angles to the deprivation and all angles to what is there again it's about then the ability to for all young people to be able to access a wide range of opportunities and as we heard in the previous debate to be able where it's appropriate to target the supports that they need so that it's not about a one size fits all you won't all not every community will require to have a particular project within their area, but the, the, the projects need to be able to be sustained beyond it. Um, the, the, being able to track the spend on, on um, education against um, attainment, it's for, I guess, for um, treasuries and financial departments to consider how that might be done, but I would suggest, as Alan did, that it's not just about the education spend on it, that there is more involved in um, raising attainment in relation to deprivation and the, the barriers that brings to it than just what you spend within your schools. Okay, thank you. Angela? Um, yes. I mean, I think Building on what colleagues have already talked about, I mean, I, I can only speak from inclusion's experience, um, which is, is, of course, partial. Um, but nonetheless, I think what we see is that each school that we work alongside is different, and that difference is mainly um, created by the leadership of the school. So what we found is most successful is to be able to adapt our very flexible service to fit with what the school has already created in terms of the recognition of barriers to attainment uh, for their pupils. And I think the key um, areas have been to, if you like, help to address the barriers for the child. Equally important to address the barriers for the parent in their role in supporting the child and also in their role in communicating effectively with the school because this is often one of the areas that causes most difficulty um, for, for teachers. And I think through doing that, what we're able to do is to then... Uh, uh, help the, the, the teachers to do the best job they possibly can because of course the limits of their role are within the school day and within the school environment and I think there are two different scenarios which emerge one is when it's known that there's a problem at home maybe because there's been a previous sibling and that it's the problems are known um, but the school maybe has no control over how those problems are, are worked through Equally as likely, we find that we're asked to work with a family and a child when the staff know that there's something wrong, but nobody's been able to get behind those closed doors and really find out what that is. And I think through doing that, often it's in those cases that we've been able to have the most impact. Because if we find that within that, actually the problems are not really to do with the child, they're often to do with the family, mental health problems with the mum, debt, a housing problem, and, and very commonly, core problems with family relationships and how families communicate with each other. Through addressing those issues, which are not education issues as such, we're then able to stabilise, to help the child to re-engage and to attend. It's as basic as making sure the child actually gets there every day at the right time, in clean clothes, hopefully having had some breakfast, and then support the parent in appropriate communication um, which then builds their confidence because very often these parents have had a very poor experience of education themselves. They lack confidence, they are resistant, and that, of course, is then communicated to the child who doesn't get the support they need, um, really in the most important aspect of their life going forward. 
Right, thank you. David. <coughs> Chairman, a number of perhaps um, disjointed thoughts, but I actually welcome the point that's made. I think there's a tendency in this country to say that we've got an educational problem, let's spend more money, uh, which is just simply not the result. It doesn't actually work. And if you look at a variety of places around the world, that actually doesn't happen. I've listened at length recently quite a lot to Graham Donaldson, the former H Chief Inspector of HMI. A lot of very sage words coming from him, I think, and, and some of the, uh, I'm sure you've spoken to, I certainly recommend speaking to you in a number of ways, fronts. Um, there's still a bit, having said, what goes into a school comes out of it. And there's no question that... Um, where we have managed to change that model, then we should be following these examples of good practice. Going back further than that, obviously, the work that Susan Deacon and others did in the early years is still to be commended, and there's no question that investing there is the place to invest. Even for us in, the, in industry, we would say that, recognising that's a bit of a problem because we've got a number of young people in that generation we're missing out, but early years is still the way to make the longer-term changes, and the biggest single determinant factor of whether you go to university or not, as we know. Um, I think there's an issue also about what we consider attainment. Um, and in my view, it should very much be focused on positive outcomes. It should not be focused on qualifications. We should stop measuring schools and qualifications. But actually, the positive outcomes for young people, because education is about uh, life and work. It is not about qualifications. Uh, it really isn't about that at all. And, I, I went, and final point, I, I very much agree with the last point I made, as I would have supposed come from the Institute of Directors, that the leadership is crucial. Uh, and if you look at good schools all across the UK, for example, there's a lot of good examples in London, as now we're all aware of. But actually, if you, every single one that I've seen identified or had any association with or seen any coverage of, it's always been a very erudite, focused head teacher that's really driven that forward. So I think that's important. And the final point as well, going back to what Graham Donaldson talks about quite a lot as well, uh, we, we tend to also talk about class sizes and numbers here of teachers. There's an awful lot of evidence that actually it's the quality of the teacher and not the quantity of the teacher that actually makes the difference. Um, Could Mr Beattie put that phone <laughs> off, please? And uh, I suppose my final point very much was, it would be, we absolutely need to focus our spending on what actually works. We do, from reports like that, we do know some of the things that work. Let's focus on that and really... Well, I think, again, I think we fundamentally believe, and I'll probably repeat it several times, we just should not have the number of young people leaving without the basic um, life skills leaving schools that we do. And it's all of our responsibility to do something about it. And obviously we'll talk about how we may address that later. OK, thank you. Uh, Susan. I think what, um, from our position at Youthlink Scotland, we'd be thinking of our education system as being just beyond schools and also to include uh, learning that takes place in other settings, in particular, from our perspective, in, in youth work. And um, in terms of um, what else beyond deprivation, I think it is, um, as colleagues have mentioned, around leadership, but it's that leadership's ability to seek an opportunity. And that opportunity may be for youth work, it may be for, for working with business, but it's about doing something differently and being brave to aspire so that young people can see that there is um, a different route um, for them to to develop and, and, and look at themselves as a whole person. And we also need to make sure that we don't just consider young people as pupils, but we consider them as young people in all aspects of their life and wherever that learning can take place, because all of those factors will con contribute towards their, their attainment. Yeah. Sorry, I'll just put my questions together. As, uh, I know we've just got an hour. <coughs> um, David, uh, <coughs> excuse me, David Watt mentioned the London Challenge. I'm pleased you did, because the EIS are not very impressed as I'm reading about the London Challenge. <coughs> Must be treated with caution. Uh, elements of the private and third sector don't fit with the structure and values at the heart of Scottish education. Any proposal for private sector involvement in Scottish education must be carefully evaluated. So with you both on the panel today, I would be uh, keen to hear uh, your views on that. Uh, certainly the First Minister seems to uh, welcome uh, many aspects of the London Challenge. Uh, but, convener, might just to finish, uh, I'm also concerned that... Uh, well, I'll just read this out again. Some councils test pupils in P1, 3, 5, 7 and S2 and others less frequently, but at a council level in Scotland, there's no consistent approach to tracking and monitoring the progress of pupils from P1 to S2. So that's a concern. It's also a concern that pupils are working at their expected level of numeracy is 0.2% of P4 pupils, 2% of P7, 
are working at, uh, sorry, not working at the expected level. Of, so 98% are working at their level of numeracy uh, in P7. When that gets to S2 two years later, that falls to 65. So what's happening between primary and secondary schools that there's uh, such a dip? And that's all that we ask it. Can I start with you, Susan? Since, uh, On all mentioned. of those. Um, <laughs> the EIS is not against any of the proposals within the London Challenge, but as with everything, we uh, have caution. The London Challenge was a four-year project which was focused in the secondary age um, group of youngsters. It's now finished within London. There was a significant spend in terms of um, taking it forward. And when it was transported wholesale to other cities, it did not see the same impact in those areas. And so it's about that caution in bringing in anything wholesale to Scotland that was designed and worked within a particular other setting. Of course, there are, will be aspects within it that are for, are for good consideration. And we met only last week with the First Minister, to, sorry, with the Cabinet Secretary, um, and you know, to consider some of the things that are being looked at within it. Within um, the Scottish system, in terms of the, the private sector, um, again, it's not about the wholesale dismissal of it. There are, again, great examples and, and lots of work that go on within our schools, but it's about the fact that it needs to be managed within the schools, within the, the operations of local authorities and within consideration of that. So it's not about wholesale dismissal of these things, but also not about just thinking that a one-size-fits-all and because it worked for four years in London, we can transport it to Scotland, put it into a totally different setting because we are looking at early intervention at this stage and think that it will work if we just we just mirror exactly what's there, and that's where our caution comes from. Elements don't fit with the structure and values at the heart of Scottish education. Which elements don't fit uh, with the Scottish education? Well, the wholesale, the, the move to academies and free schools, where you uh, within the, the, the English system are ones that we would be that we'd find difficult as a, an option in terms I'm of sitting about the within... private and third sector input. And that's the private and third sector input into academies and free schools. There are um, the consortiums of academies where they're funded and run by private sectors, by, by private companies. There are options and difficulties around that in terms of what sits within the Scottish system. What we have here is a system which allows for a uh, Scottish curriculum being delivered at local level so that it can meet the needs of the young people that are there. There are difficulties around the, um, the tracking systems you talk about within the fact that they say there's no consistent approach. As far as I can see, the, some local authorities have moved to take account of the new proposals around assessment um, and moderation within the, within the curriculum as it has been developed and have moved away from only simply being considering um, attainment as being the scores on the doors. And that's where there are differences in terms of how they track their attainment within their own local areas. So some areas will still have use of a standardised test, but I would suggest that if that's the only aspects that they're using, then they're doing exactly what um, we don't want them to do, which is they're setting out a system which only looks at um, attainment in very narrow areas, but not looking at the achievement of their schools, not taking into account what is there within the, the, the wider options that show the, what the curriculum was designed to do. Bring in yeah. other people, Mary. 
We're all in this room fiercely proud of Scottish education, but that doesn't mean we should become biopic. Um, I think uh, we gave it to the world, but uh, sometimes the world can teach us other lessons as well. I think we should look at London and other examples of options where we can do things. I think there are examples already in Scotland where the, the, the private sector and certainly the third sector creates significant uh, opportunity in education as well and supports both inside and outside school young people. I think it's really important to remember that as well. But we really should look for evidence for other places, you know, for example, Sweden, which have adopted a system I probably would have advocated until I heard about it, which was devolving, you know, full scale management to the head teachers and they've dropped from OECD rankings from 5th to 20th over a 20 year period in doing that. So we've got to be cautious about what we're actually adopting and not adopting. But if there is evidence there's other things going on, we should certainly be looking at it. And I think the final point uh, I would make, I, I'm... And we are very fiercely enthusiastic about curriculum for excellence, um, some reservations, but in general principle, I think it's fantastic. And the reason I support it so strongly is because it's, it's turned, I th hope, secondary education to, away from teaching subjects to teaching young people. Uh, and I hope that we'll actually then develop young people through that. And that everybody, no matter their level of attainment, will improve as a result. There's a lot to be done to make that actually happen. Uh, but as a, uh, a former teacher myself a long time ago, I guess, say, um, but uh, um, we did in secondary education focus too much on learning French as opposed to developing young people. Uh, and I think we've moved away from that. I think it's very welcome. I think there will be positive outcomes, but we all need to keep focusing. And, and please, please, please keep looking at the evidence and not just even, I say, my dogma would be in the Swedish model. I now accept it probably wasn't a good idea. Okay. Anybody else? Angela. Uh, really, just to pick up, um, following on from David's last point, an earlier point that, that he made about early years and investment in early years, which we'd absolutely support. But actually, the evidence also shows that it's absolutely essential to do early intervention at all stages. And we think that the opportunity for the transition between primary and secondary schools is one where particularly a focus on what's happening at home on working with parents and children to prepare for that, to um, gear them up for that, you know, that major shift, one of those points where vulnerable children and young people tend to sort of fall off the edge, um, you know, really demonstrates that it's worth, worth making. An, an, you can make an early intervention at any point, both to improve individual outcomes and to prevent worse things, worse things happening. Sorry, Mary, did you want to... Final but, I mean, you can only make an early intervention if you know that there's an issue that needs to be addressed. And my point is that if there's no continual assessment of children from uh, nursery, in fact, I think nurseries are almost, they're doing very, very good work. I think they're probably better, but not always getting the support uh, that they need. But if we don't know, if we're not assessing and continually assessing uh, and consistently assessing. We don't know where there's a problem until they leave school. So it's all very well saying, yes, we'll put in measures. But what we heard in the audit committee is many councils are buying very expensive private, sec private tests from England and there's no way of evaluation or peer comparisons or anything. Yeah, so but, my but, point is sorry. that, you know, unless we know there's a problem, we can't then address it. And that's what... I'm looking for that has to be the first step, identifying who needs support and who needs a home link worker or whatever. Okay. Um, I think Susan wanted, Susan Quinn yeah, wanted absolutely. to come to Susan Hunt. Sorry, you're incorrect to suggest that there's no assessment going on. There is continued... There is, assessment there is no, inconsistent. There, but there, across the country, the in every, no, across local authorities, they use a different system for yeah. assessing attainment within every single establishment, within every single classroom. Room, there is continuous assessment and if you were to ask any no teacher consistent approach is what I'm reading from here about how local authorities are, how local authorities are measuring so they, that they know from but within P1 to S3, no Mary so let, let, yeah. let Susan answer yeah. within every local authority they will have their own policy for how they do that within every single classroom within every single early years establishment a whole range of assessments go on Every teacher would be able to tell you any child who they felt were having difficulties with it. They, it what's there within Audit Scotland is around what local authorities are, where they are measuring and how the approaches they do. They have always 
had a range of strategies. We, we did have one when we had national assessments. There were still local authorities that spent thousands and thousands of pounds on standardised tests because it was part of a toolkit for assessing everything that's there. There is a whole range of ways of assessing what is needed and what's there, which is how we would know and how schools do know if they need to, to um, look for other um, approaches. And it's why they do use... Um, uh, Dave is quite right. We do use third sector and, and private sectors in a whole range of different ways. What's difficult sometimes within establishments is to know what's available and what's appropriate within their, their area. But work can be done around that and is being done in terms of getting it right for every child and making sure that local solutions are available for local children. But in terms of the knowledge and understanding of each individual child and whether or not there needs to be early intervention, schools know where, where, that, where that's needed. Schools just need to be able to know where they can, where they can access it. I should go back and also say I think that one of the pluses of working alongside the third sector, and it's where if we um, are able to do so in a manner where schools know how to access it. It quite often will be the case that a family will engage with a third sector organisation um, in, in a really positive way because there's no threat of formality. They don't feel, you know, they, they, they worry. If, you, if, you, if we go through um, social work to, and say we're going to use it, because often it will be a third sector group that will be there, There'll be resistance because social workers say they have to. But if there's a, a, a proposal between the, the partnership of the school and the home through third sector, then it's often received in a much more positive way because they don't feel threatened by it. OK, thank you. I, I'm, I'm going to bring in uh, Mark at this point. Thanks, Kabina. Members of the panel touched on earlier um, issues around uh, measuring achievement. Um, rather than attainment and talking about young people's life and um, work experience and, and skills that they've gained outside of the, the school and education system. Um, but a lot of the evidence that, that we've had is um, pointing towards local authorities having difficulties in, in recognising those skills and that achievement that young people have had out, outside of school. Um, our members be able to give any opinion as how to how we start um, or how local authorities can start um, recognising that achievement and how likely it is that schools, employers, uh, colleges and universities start to add a, a greater weight to that achievement um, when it comes to offering young people positions. Okay, so Thank you for, for asking that question. It's something that, that we're particularly interested in, um, as many of our member organisations are part of the awards network, which is a forum f around um, supporting achievement awards. Um, some of those are credit rated on TSCQF and others aren't. And, and as a sector, we're concerned that, that the use of Insight, which is the benchmarking tool, can only cope with um, those awards which are SCQF credit rated. Things like Duke of Edinburgh Award and the, 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 the highest um, award in scouting are not credit rated in that way, but they are awards that are recognised by business, by employers, by universities as having real currency as an indicator of young people's skills. Um, something that I think we're particularly interested in is about empowering the young people to be able to articulate their own skills and their learning so that they can be their, they're their best advocates that is to be for themselves. So we would want that the learning that the young people are undertaking whether that's in the classroom or within youth work that the young person understands what it is they have achieved and how they can translate that to different audience, be that be an employer to their parent, to their class teacher around what it is that they learn and what they are able to do. Um, young person's voice is something that's been developed very much within classrooms at this point. It's a, it's a high priority um, within the curriculum and making, being able to articulate um, what they're learning. And it's one of the things that when schools are inspected is at this point is, is very highly um, considered by the inspection teams. It's not just that they're, they're less interested anymore in the bits of paper that say what the schools say they're doing, but actually that the young people can articulate 
in the exact same way as their, their, their teachers hopefully can what it is that's going on within their classrooms and out with it that's having an impact in, in their learning. I think um, Susan's right. It is about us trying to find ways to include these wider achievements within the likes of Insight and giving that broader, broader recognition to it. I think there's also um, have been moves, and, and more recently we have um, heard where universities are beginning to give weight not just to the qualifications that you know the, the, the hires and, and advanced hires that young people are getting, but are, are beginning to look for the, the the wider the wider conversation of of what they've achieved. So there is some work there that's beginning to happen, but there's an awful lot to be done, I think, around the fact that the focus on qualifications, and we've seen that recently in terms of the the high profile of the, the introduction of the first year of the new qualifications compared to perhaps what the media were interested in in the 10 plus years of the introduction of the broad general education. I think there's a lot to be done in terms of how we um, promote wider achievement to, to, to the wider Scottish um, society. Okay, thank you. Alan. It's just interesting. We had uh, 350 young people with us at Hamden uh, two weeks ago at an event we called Welcome to Your Future. And it was, uh, we had about 40 different employers uh, and they come from the, the 100 or so XL uh, clubs that we run in schools across Scotland. And what was interesting there was just giving young people um, access to here are the jobs that are out there. Here's what you will need to do those jobs. And most of the employers weren't starting from the point of view of you know, particular qualifications. There, were, there, was, there was an attitude they were looking for. There was a certain uh, range of experiences they might want to see. What I think that does is it helps young people um, ask the right questions. Uh, at the moment, it is very much framed around about uh, just putting in the qualifications. And you know, we've all written a CV. Um, you know, you're starting to think about what sort of person am I and trying to capture that and giving people the belief in themselves and a lot of the activity they've taken with um, either youth organisations or with the Prince's Trust or some of the activities they've done in school, uh, if they can actually present that in a way that's attractive to employers. But they need to understand what it is uh, the employers are looking for. And I think that's what will start to close that gap between uh, people's perception that they've got no skills and nothing to offer and what employers are actually looking for. And it's, you know, it's unfair to expect just teachers or parents to know what the jobs are. Um, you know, the jobs of the future will be very different. So I think it's one of the very positive things um, of bringing the third sector and then groups of employers together just to show people there are choices and opportunities for you. Um, can I bring in Colin Beatty at this stage? Colin. Thank you, Convener. I'd, li I'd like to expand a wee bit on uh, some of the points that have been touched on there. We've heard various submissions which seem to indicate that uh, there's a, a, a discrepancy between what schools and parents see as valuable and what the employers see as valuable. And we touched on that just now, but it appears that according to the submissions we received that schools, further education institutions and parents seem to value much more highly the academic qualifications, whereas employers, as was touched on, are looking for social skills, attitude and, and, and a much wider approach. How, how can that gap be bridged? I was going to actually relate to some just feedback I was making the previous point as well. I think, first of all, it would be lovely, bluntly, if politicians and the media in particular didn't focus on academic league tables uh, and, and actually in, in terms of how they rate schools. There might be an opposite, I would suggest, there might be a literacy league table that schools that shouldn't be allowed to let young people basically leave until they can read, write and spell appropriately. Uh, well, spelling's maybe going, but uh, at least read. Um, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a serious issue. I mean, genuinely, I, I, I get all the time from employers, it's, it's basic literacy. Most employers do not want, do not expect anybody, wherever they come from, school, college, university, to be ready to work, to be ready to do the job they expect them to be ready to work, and that's a slightly different thing. And I'll expand on that in a minute. Um, but I also think it's we need to be, as I said earlier, it's about a positive destination. I think schools should be made to record in the way that colleges and universities quite clearly, over a period of time, what the destinations of these young people are. Okay, so they actually track them along, and I'm not talking. And I absolutely would the point. I constantly make this point. I've not been with the IOD somewhat unbelievably to me as well. Twelve years. And in 12 years, I have never had anybody, never had anybody knock on my door and say, I can't find a graduate. 
just never happened. But I have had them say, I can't find a mass spectrometer technician, I can't find an apprentice engineer, I can't find engineers of any sort. Uh, I could go on, um, you know, a whole variety of trades and skills that people want. We're all concerned, uh, we're particularly concerned the construction trade during the recession, and there's still some challenges coming out of that as well. So absolutely, um, I think we focus far too much in this country, if I'm honest, about going to university. It's not the be-all and end-all, and it's not necessarily the career for everybody. Many young people, many bright people, many of the best, most successful people in this country didn't go to university at all or went later in life. Jim McCall and others are examples of that. So I think we need to, to, to change some of our traditional thinking. Education is not just about going to university. It's a lifelong experience that you can still keep doing. We can all still keep doing as well. And the employers help with that once you're employed. But your point, basic point is absolutely employers want somebody who literally can read, write and count, very basically, uh, who will get up in the morning and uh, uh, attend their workplace, who understands what working is like, which is why I think the Wood Commission and other reports about, uh, I mean, at the moment, basically, you can leave school in Scotland having done one week of work experience. I mean, that's just madness. I mean, how, how does one week teach you anything about anything? You know, and it depends where you get it and how you get it. So there's a massive job for us in the private sector to do as well in engaging with schools and indeed perhaps colleges and universities and changing the model of education that engages young people that actually understand what it's all about and gives them the opportunity and opens their eyes, as was mentioned, to the opportunities that are out there. And they're not all about academic achievement. They are about achievement, they're about doing things. And I think the other thing that relates again to the last point, I think schools, again, and this is happening, to be fair, it's a personal record of achievement that matters, not the number of qualifications you've got to end of that, but you know, how, I mean, bluntly, I suppose, how many days you've been off school. You know, are you timorous? Do you turn up in time? Are you consistent? Are you enthusiastic about things you do, even if you're not good at them, and so on? All these things we'd all want in people working beside us. And I think the school can record what kids can do. And it doesn't mean them, they need to be the brain of Britain. They just need to be consistent deliverers of that. And that really does count. And let's write that down and record achievement and attainment in that sense, not academic achievement. OK, thank you. Angela. Um, yes, I, um, and I said earlier that family relationship problems often lay at the root of um, many of the situations we work in. And, you know, although every situation we work with is different, there's always an issue about family relationships and difficulties. And I, I think that um, the features that are, if you like, desirable to employers are the same features that help functional families stay together. So, in effect, I think by working with families around their own social skills, their communications, the boundaries between parents and children, and indeed self-management, and by that I mean self-management not just for the child, but for the parent, we can then set a bit of a, a, a grounding to find maybe that one thing that a child or young person might believe that they're good at. And I think that has to be the, the stepping stone to find the talent, to find the interest, be it sport, arts, that allows them to get some praise and recognition. And I think then from that, you can build up a virtuous circle because I think unsurprisingly, you know, children develop sort of reputation within schools for not for being difficult, for not being good. Teachers have got classes, they've got, you know, that whole group to, to, to look after. You know, and the children who are presenting difficulties then reinforce the view of them. And I think if we can break into that, what we found again is a real shift in relationships between children and their teachers. And then teachers actually feel more confident about their skills in responding back to some of these children with difficulties. And we found some very interesting feedback around that, schools that we're working with. Um, so I would absolutely agree that I think it's essential that the outcomes uh, need to be recognised as far greater than, than attainment. I mean, I think the GERFEC framework gives a fantastic opportunity for that, the use of the Shinari indicators, um, the methodology around wellbeing web, which helps a young person to track their own progress and see how well they've developed in really important areas like, like anger management. And that that really gives the bedrock, it's the personal skills which really are required for living in communities, working in workplaces, 
and then hopefully going on to uh, create future functional families. Thank you. Susan. Yeah. Um, I'll start with saying schools only focus on qualifications because that sadly is what they get measured on by pretty much everybody else. And so that's, that's why there's a whole lot of other things go on in schools which people don't hear about in the same way because um, it's not what at this point, although we hear, you know, business wants, you know, particular aspects and whatever, it's not what's um, sexy in terms of the media that we're doing these things within our schools. And we, we do, we do certainly um, aspire to make sure that there's a bit more um, balance between what the qualifications aspect and the formal qualifications and um, the, the historic formal qualifications also are, are there because they say that's what schools get measured on. I think one of the things that we need to move forward with um, are about the, the range of opportunities that our young people are experiencing and the development around the um, Scotland's young workforce provides us with a framework to engage in um, conversations to get a balance between the, 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 the formal traditional academic and the vocational because you know we wouldn't want to see a position where it was either or there's there's a there's a balance to be had there people will will be able to 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 come and go within within the range and have something which is tailored to them but also some of it is about um, education of, of the wider society around what the new qualifications are about. We still focus on um, spelling and handwriting and, and things. When, you know, in, in, in modern day, we have to ask, where, where do they sit in it? Are they, are they, are they the 75% of the, the priorities as, that they were when I was at school? Or is there, is, are there are other things now and is there a balance to be had about it? Um, and, and within that, then you look at the wider range of opportunities for actual formal academic qualifications that young people are being offered, um, the, the, where you can do maths that's, you know, life skills maths. But yet we hear that it's not being given the same um, credibility as having a maths qualification. So there's an education out there around you know around this the, the new aspects and the, the the developing aspects of the of qualifications that need to be taken account of too because those are the qualifications that actually the young people that we're, we're discussing here this morning will be engaging with you know life skills maths and literacy um, work that is about the day-to-day -day life are exactly what business are looking for but yet we don't give them this, you know, people go, oh, you've not got a higher maths. Well, you have, you've got something that's doing, a, it's just got a different content. Same, same academic levels, but we don't, we don't give them the same, the same credence. Discussed, I mean, logically, there is this, uh, this division between what the employer's expectation is and perhaps what the parents and schools are looking for. Is, are the schools likely to have the, are the infrastructure or the time to deliver these non-academic skills that the employers are looking for? They, 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 they do what they do within the structures that are there, which is why, as I say, they, we do work alongside third sector and, and others in, in supporting that. We heard that, you know, class sizes isn't, you know, the answer to everything. The IS would argue that class sizes and numbers of teachers does make a difference where you know you, you, you're engaging with smaller groups that there, there needs to be opportunities for that to happen but schools are timetabling and, and hopefully as we, we move to a situation where the full rollout of the the, the senior phase um, and the, the, the intended um, principles of curriculum for excellence are seen will provide space within timetables to engage in wider achievement and the wider life skills projects that need to happen. At the moment, what we've got in lots of places is just a duplication of the, the old system of qualifications. The, and as we move forward and the, the recommendations from the reflections group on the, the qualifications and the work that's going through the CFE management board should see us with a position where 
you know, properly resourced, they, they, that will that will free up the time to do it because you'll be taking a different approach to how the qualifications are. Just just one final last question. Just one last final question there. Um, University of Scotland have uh, referred in their evidence that uh, private schools are very good at producing sort of carefully crafted statements with high status relevant uh, content, whereas uh, people from state schools seem to receive a lot less assistance in composing their statement and they struggle to draw on suitable work and life experience, which comes back to what we were talking about previously. And they also contain a lot of writing errors, I believe. Um, how can schools best present people's skills and abilities to employers, colleges, universities? How can, how can they best do that? Alan? I think I go back to you know, just giving young people access to those opportunities and just seeing what the jobs might be. I mean, there's whole sectors out there that young people don't understand, and even the ones they do think they understand. So things like retail or hospitality, we've all been to a shop, we've all been to a hotel involving to a restaurant, but actually understanding what that career in involves and how that career could be structured, and therefore what I've done at school, what I've done at a in a youth organisation, what I've done perhaps in, in other third sector organisations, being able to reflect that. So that's, I think that's one element. Second one is, is, is of course, uh, many schools uh, and certain environments can just give people so much more support. They have had somebody who's been to that university who understands exactly what's required. So having mentors, um, you know, and again, Princess Trust and other organisations have access to, to a large number of uh, people who are willing to give up their time uh, to support young people. And again, with the assistance of schools, you can find ways to, you know, to bring that extra support into, uh, into the school, especially when someone either needs to make that university application or to to apply for the jobs. I think there's resource out there that we don't tap into as well as we could. But again, I, my central point would just be show, show young people the chances and the opportunities, and I think they will respond. We did ask, I asked young people uh, last week when I was sitting with a group, um, you know, what would really uh, get you sort of motivated? One thing was they did say it's a very confusing alphabet of qualifications. So at the moment, you know, what, what did you study at school? And they struggle sometimes to tell you what qualifications they got. Um, because was it an old standard grade, an NC, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, they find that difficult to cope with. The second thing was they said, well, the head teacher, you know, if we actually said if the head teachers were um, performance managed on the basis of how many of us got a job, that would be an interesting uh, thing, thing to look at. So I, I hate to put another um, sort of layer of performance measure, but again, it was just as long if they felt that the leader, it goes back to this point, but if they feel that the leadership of the school is genuinely interested in that child's long-term future, that will turn them on as well. Brody, you're on this. Yeah, I, I mean, coming back to this, this business of, of qualifications in terms of, you know, <clears throat> said before, I abhor targets and, and improve performance outcomes, I think, are, are the way to go. Um, just in achieving that, though, I mean, what role, we mentioned earlier, the role of parents, and I think including mentioned that you know, attainment um, resources need to be invested in parent-school relationships. I mean, they're not good, are they, parent-school relationships in general? I mean, I know that we might have some, some children that need help and things like that, but in general... It, it will depend on the area and it will depend on the parents. There are, there are um, pockets of, of schools... Why does it just depend on parents? Be, well, it depends on the parents. Sometimes it will depend on the parents' um, attitude to school themselves. If you've had a bad experience of school, if you don't have um, that, that approach to you know, a positive approach to it, then you're, you're going to stay away from it. You don't want to, to engage. And that's where... As I say, there are, are, are great opportunities for working with third sector because it can help to, to build that to it. Schools work really, really hard to try to develop um, links with parents. Um, and the difficulty, there, there are a whole range of, of, of so options, what? difficulties on it. I, what I was going to say was that parental involvement and the the level of engagement of parents also has the impact on Mr Beattie's question around um, how you know those who are in the private sector are able to produce better statements and things because there is definitely a link with how much of that is done in, in school and how much of it actually is done through 
through families and through the work that's 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 there. So, yeah, there there, there are, there's a lot of work to be done with that. Some of it will be generational around. Well, I you know I didn't like school, so I'm not going to go back to school. And if I'm, I'm only, I only get call, parents only get called to school if if the wane's in trouble. And, and some of that's about breaking down those barriers, and you see loads of opportunities for sharing and celebrating success, which gets parents in, into schools now and gives them a much more positive but, experience. But does it come it. back to the situation that we just talked about in terms of qualifications? That parents are also driven by those that you know, are interested, driven by qualifications, and not the wider, you know, societal uh, uh, outcome that we that we expect. Mm -hmm. Again, I just want one, one, one other question on that. Well, yeah, very quickly. Okay, carry on. No, no, just a... It's just the wider outcome in terms of the role of, of youth, like I mean, in terms of, you know, I was surprised to find the number of members that the Boys Brigade have when I had a meeting with them here, yeah. and also the Scouts organisation, the Girl Guides. I mean, again, you know, who drives that? What involvement? How do we encourage parents to get involved in these type of these type of, of organisations, which can have the wider outcome? Well, I think they, particularly the uniformed organisations, many of their volunteers come through young people having been participants in that programme themselves, and and their continued evolution into contributing their time to help other young people. So they do start to have that better understanding of the wider skills and attributes and values that young people can develop um, beyond the school gates. Um, on on Friday evening, I was um, attended the Scottish Borders um, Inspire Awards, and that was about recognition of volunteering. There was eighteen thousand hours of volunteering taken, undertaken by young people in the Scottish Borders. And in that audience was parents. And that was really, really important that parents could see that the, the opportunities that were available, the ones that their own child participate in, but ones that others are, and how that, 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 that builds to be beyond um, just what has been done within school. However, some of that work was done in partnership with school, and that's equally important. Right. I'm going to bring in George at this stage, because I know thank you a bit of an overlap there, I think. And thank you for Mr Brodie for nicking my question. Yeah, no, I can't. <laughs> Uh, yes. But basically, I, I, I want to expand on that, uh, is uh, the role of uh, the third sector, and we mentioned earlier on, it's not just about uh, school, it's not just about what happens in the school as well, it's about, the, yes, the, the uniformed uh, kind of the girls' guides, uh, girls' brigade, BB and scouts, they all do work in the past, but things have been repackaged now, and there seems to be a lot of good work happening out there that is attainment-based, but they're using like sport and drama and the arts as a way to try and uh, get to the harder to reach uh, children now. My thing is, where is the role for the third sector? Because uh, uh, it's the third sector that's effectively doing that. So where is the role with that, the third sector working with schools to try and get these uh, children, to make sure that we can get them into the, the right kind of career path? I think the, the, those opportunities require really, really effective partnerships locally between the, the, all the education providers involved in that, so that be that the school or the arts organisation, the youth organisation, so that there's a real understanding of what the needs of that cohort of young people are or that community needs, and making sure that what the third sector offers is responsive to, to an identified need, um, and that making sure that that programme is delivered in partnership, but that all the learning is recognised and valued by all the partners involved, and, and I think Susan made the point in her very first comment was about when you have programmes and opportunities like that you need funding over a longer term to make them a success because for schools to commit to work in an alternative way it has to work beyond the financial year because the school year is different from the financial year in the, in the first instance so you may only have a programme for half of your school year um, but you also need to be able to timetable for the year ahead that, that you know there will be a cohort of young people who could benefit from um, some sort of alternative curriculum um, or an expansion of curriculum for excellence but delivered by, by a partner organisation so there, there is some conditions and when we've written those conditions within our written response um, which, which you can look at around what it would take for, for those partnerships to be effective over the longer term. Yeah, I mean, I think I would, I would heartily agree with that. Um, I was very struck. We had uh, the chief executive of a council was describing his visit to one of our um, schools that ran Excel clubs, which is a Prince's Trust program, um, which I think does it makes the space in the curriculum a, a pupil might drop a subject like French that they're maybe not uh, seeing uh, you know much benefit from, uh, and instead it's built into the curriculum. They do community work, they do um, personal development, they might do 
uh, work experience. And he visited two XL clubs, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. The one in the morning, very chaotic, quite difficult for the, the teacher and the XL advisor. The one in the afternoon was um, you know, performing brilliant as a team. It was a real sense of cohesion, a real sense of enjoyment and aspiration. And the difference was one was the year one club and one was the year two club. Uh, so I think, you know, to that point about these these kinds of problems must be run over a consistent period of time. And then I think most importantly, have, have proper follow-on. So one of the things we're doing at the moment is following the, uh, the Wood Commission is to look at how do we then take young people from some of these programmes into uh, our employer-based programmes with the Marks and Spencers and Arnold Clark, uh, just to give them, you know, real opportunities for jobs that, that they can grab onto. And unless you can keep that journey moving... The danger is that people drop through the cracks at some point and we might not see them again for three or four years. They might come from the job centre when they're 20 uh, and they'd, they'd be missing. So I think having long-term commitments in school, but also making sure that those next steps, um, when they're not the traditional academic linear route, are thought through and are, there's opportunities through the third sector and the private sector for them to move on to. Okay, uh, Angela. Just, just quickly, I think in terms of the behind-the-scenes work with the parents, I think it's really important, and we're very conscious of this, that we don't want to only be effective while we're there supporting the parents to support children into these other opportunities. Our aspiration has to be for a su sustainable solution. So that's why we'll look at doing things like working separately with the parent away from the child on their skills in supporting a child with their homework, for example. Because otherwise what happens is, if a service like ours moves away from the home, and that might not be visible because we aren't so visible to the schools as, as some of the other services that are, are physically located, then all the work that's been done by the school alongside other partners can quickly collapse. So I think having that, you know, sustainable approach, which is the investment, the investment in the family and in the parents' skills, then in the longer term supports a young person and indeed hopefully their siblings following after. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, Susan kind of two parts to it from, from what Macaulay's said and, and the first part is around the, the the knowledge of schools of what is out there because some of it will depend on who within a, a local authority has a, a has a, a comprehensive list of what's available within their area and that sharing of sharing of information and that catalogue if you like of what's available in different areas so that schools can then target and, and approach it and build it into what they're planning for and try to look at that long term. The other part, particularly in secondary schools at this point, I suppose, is about how you then start to create the time for it to be within the, the school day. And as I said earlier, part of that will be around the move to the qualification stage, the senior phase becoming a three-year senior phase, which allows for longer time to focus on everything. So you, you're not doing your hires over a, a quick one-year, nine-month period, but actually doing it over a two-year period, which then allows for you get a bit more depth to the, the knowledge and understanding of those actual qualifications, but frees up a bit of time to be able to engage in um, wider achievement programmes that will have a have a, a different impact on on your life chances. So I think there's there's kind of different parts to it. Sorry. Yes. Uh, basically, the, it's funny Susan Hunter brought up the, the idea of working in partnership because in Renfrewshire there is the street stuff, which is Renfrewshire Council, the local football club St Mirren, uh, the police, fire and rescue and engage Renfrewshire, the third sector. Now, it's been very successful in using street football and other street a uh, bus, it's a gym, everything else. Now, is there any way they deal with a lot of uh, hard-to-reach children that uh, are difficult for schools, difficult for everyone else to be able to engage with? And it's because of the credibility of that St Martin tracksuit. You know, whether it be strokes to St Martin put it at anywhere else and anywhere else, <laughs> it'll be that football team's uh, kind of tracksuit. So how, how do we... Am I being too sensible here? And uh, too practical when I say, is there any way that we could possibly, when you're talking about the partnership working, 
get all these groups together and take that to that idea to the next level. I know the funding's available. We already kind of do funding in various things, but there's not a way we could get them all working together to use that as an access point to ensure that we get these young people. I think it was mentioned by uh, a witness a couple of weeks ago that there was a young boy that they had difficulty engaging with at school. But they found out he was a boxer. The minute they actually dealt with him from that perspective, they found out he was very disciplined, he knew about health and nutrition, and they got him on the right uh, track again. So is there any way we can try and get all these, because you said partnership working was extremely important. Is there not a way we can get a programme like that, which is happening all over the country, and try and make it larger? Or is that me just being far too sensible? Well, I think there is that, but I think there's also about it being responsive to local needs and even more local on that than individual needs. And, you know, the example you've given of that yeah, one young person, so if you were to develop a boxing programme and put it into the local authority, it probably wouldn't work because mm -hmm. that was the thing that hooked and connected and created a language and a dialogue between a professional and a young person around a, a specific interest. I think there is no shortage of creativity as to whatever that hook is it's there. And, and as Susan said about, you know, the, this sort of catalogue of what the offer is, quite often the offer is not yet created, so it's not in the catalogue. It's about knowing who those professionals are that have something to offer to the lives of young people in their community and creating something with the young people that's really going to make, make a difference to them. Um, but the, the issue around, around funding of, of such programmes is that probably in the examples you've, met, you've said there, there's been no devolution of funding from the school resource into working with those young people. That funding is coming from external funders, from charitable sources, direct from Scottish Government, mm -hmm. um, through whatever other means. And that's the challenge that the third sector has in that sometimes there's a feeling of it's great to work in partnership with school, but they've sought that funding first and then gone ch chapping on the door of the school to say, we've got this money, we've got this great idea, we'd like to run this with young people in your school or in our, in our shared community. So there's something about um, seeing the value of what those offers are and, and considering that as preventative spending. And Alan said earlier about investing in young people, and, and that's what YouthWork does, it invests in young people. David, yeah. This is a, a command not support to see. I don't see a connection between St. Bernard and football, but... Um, uh, <coughs> interesting, and again, I'll go back to my background previously, which, which was sport and recreation, and one night we could solve a lot of the problems we're talking about if we actually to, to take some of our health spending and put it into schools between three and five or four and six and have voluntary activities and, God bless them, St Bernard, and I'm involved in the Scottish Sports Future Show. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> well, um, and uh, uh, I do sympathise. Uh, and... Uh, through, through Scottish, I'm on the board of Scottish Sporting Futures, which deals with basketball and, and, and actually in the same area as well, doing a lot of good work across the country. Cash for uh, crime has come in, and, and that's really helpful. I think that we really need to think differently, and I, I actually do think that can make a significant difference for outside school hours as well as inside school. There's an opportunity to expose young people to that sort of scheme, which actually will last with them for the rest of their life. Uh, and I certainly think sport can do, but so can art, culture, and other, other studies as well. And I'm sure, you know, science clubs and other things we're talking about, outside school as well as inside school, funded in that sort of time. Thank you. Uh, Liam MacArthur. Thanks very much. Um, I, just in case the wrong message goes out from the, the committee, it's cash, cash for communities, the cash for crime uh, would send out altogether the wrong message. Um, <laughs> and I did notice, I was listening very hard, but I noticed that Susan didn't answer the question as to whether or not George was being sensible. Uh, which, which was, but could I move on from the role of the third sector to um, the, the status of the third sector? Maybe this is going to exploit the fact that the two Susans are either ends of the panel here. Um, but there's a bit of, um, a, 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 of a divergence of opinion and the evidence we've, we've got. I think that the, the, um, the, the evidence from the youth work sector, and if I quote Youth Scotland, suggesting what, what is becoming very clear to the youth work sector is the need for youth workers to be seen in the spirit of Curriculum for Excellence as equals amongst education providers. Um, the, the, the view, by contrast, from Renfrewshire Council, saying that although the third and private sectors can and do play an important part in the joint effort to raise attainment and achievement, it is done so by complementing the excellent work of teachers and going on to, I think, make, up, make the point about teachers being accountable for educational outcomes. Uh, is this something where there is any likelihood of us seeing more of a kind of parity of esteem between those in the youth work sector um, and, and those in the, in the teaching profession, possibly once the, the senior phase of, of curriculum for excellence is, is, is fully bedded down? Or is that either not desirable um, and, and, and not practical to expect? 
I think from, from our perspective, the, the, the workforce that deliver youth work is, is diverse. So it ranges from people who have got master's level qualifications um, to volunteers who volunteer one hour a week in their local youth group. So what we are trying to look at is, and through our partnership with the CLD Standards Council, is there's now a code of ethics for youth workers, um, there's professional registration on a voluntary basis for youth workers, and these things are in quite, they're still in their infancy compared to the teaching profession, and it's about making sure that those um, those initiatives are invested in so that our workforce can feel confident and empowered that they are of equal value in the life of a young person in terms of contributing to their education. So it's not about competing, and I actually think um, the, the quote about youth work or third sector complementing, that's exactly what we want to be doing, is we do want to be adding value to the experiences that a young person has in their, in their life. Um, so it's not about a competition, but I think it's about knowing that what youth work does has a value, it has a monetary value, but also has a social value, and making sure that professionals, whether that's a teacher or a social worker or, or otherwise, um, recognises that the youth work has a, has a place within we, that. Is the answer to this then maybe the, the point you were making, Susan, about um, sustaining these partnerships over time, that actually the parity of esteem comes from the fact that this is seen as a genuine partnership rather than something yeah. that is, is, is reached for on an ad hoc basis as resources allow. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that sustainability of partnerships is where they grow and they, and they, they do strengthen and you do get uh, an, an understanding of how, rather than, you know, you parachuting somebody in for one afternoon a week for six weeks because that's what the funding allows for and then they disappear from the life of the school and from, you know, that... That parachuting in and in of itself can create a body of work for the school that means that actually the impact is limited in the in the longer term. But I think if you can create and sustain partnerships, what happens is people begin to work together, they complement each other and they, they can build down what's the best there. What you don't want is a situation where young people are engaging with, with youth work um, colleagues but then going into class and going, I'm not, I'm not going to engage with the teacher because they are the teacher. You know, so it has to be a situation where the, the educational professionals are able to work alongside and not simply separate, separate bodies to it. Um, and, and some of that is about s sustaining projects. I've, we've seen situations where the likes of sense over sectarianism projects within the city of Glasgow that has gone on for a number of years now. The same workers are going into the schools on, on an annual basis so they get to know the young people who are coming through. They have an expectation that they're going, you know. But where it's quick hits and vanish, then there's nothing to be sustained. And as I say, in some cases, it can actually be a workload issue that isn't borne out by the, the, the positives to it. So it is about sustaining projects that and, are there. And presumably the other benefit, getting back to I think the line of question being um, pursued by, by others, actually the way in which the, the, the private sector um, recognises what's being uh, achieved through that wider attainment is easier to do if, if they can see a kind of visibility over a period of, of, of what this, this work and this partnership delivers. Is that... I think, that's true. I, think, I think the point was well made earlier on, but some kids struggle to, to write their, their attainment you know, uh, stories and, and, and what they do outside of school and perhaps in projects in school with, with others is really important as well. And articulating that is really important. And I mean, we've seen this, this last year in Scotland, the, the impact of, of volunteer at a very, very high level. And that profile is actually quite good. I hope it spills and lasts that legacy for young people to understand how important it is to do like that and a massive international worldwide project depended on the volunteers. And life of it depends on volunteer effort as well. And if you show that uh, bit of extra effort, um, and, and you can reflect it uh, in your uh, personal statements, then I think actually absolutely employers buy into that. What, what you do, you know, and another involvement in reserve forces, same type of thing. You are a special person if you do that, take that sort of commitment on as well as your day job, if you like. I think the same for young people. They're, they all have challenging young lives uh, through puberty, but if they're doing action volunteering and showing other things, it's, it, it's absolutely recognised by employers, without a doubt it is. It, distinct, it distinguishes you from the crowd and it makes you much more employable. Okay, um, Gordon. I think at this stage, Gordon. Um, 
I, th I think I've got from the panel that there has to be a move away from a total focus on academic qualifications. So in terms of vocational education, what should be the role of the private sector in our schools? And given that um, only 27% of employers take on a young person straight from school and only 13% of employers take on an apprentice, how would it help to address the low level of school leaver employment? I think these, these figures are, are, are based on a, and a, and a number of, reflect rather a number of issues. And I think one of them is still, in my view, not enough engagement uh, and bluntly in the private sector and all that. And many aspects of Scottish civic life and education is certainly one of them as well. Uh, we really need to engage at a local level within all schools, colleges and universities, significantly uh, employers. Um, and I think that this is a two-way thing. It's actually about, I, I do think employers coming in and talking about work experiences, and in my view, probably ideally younger employees as well, about how it actually is to work and what they do and things like that. Particularly in a, in a very, I think the point was well made earlier on about the complexities of work, and particularly with technology and the changing patterns mm -hmm. of work and the, the, the fact that most of us won't have a career for life and all this sort of thing. So there's massive changes in young people, quite complex for all of us to understand, and certainly for them before they get into the workplace. So there's that bit of, if you like, educating the young people. There's also a bit of educating the employees. And that's why I think that, that work placements are, are fantastic. I mean, if you go to a higher level in terms of age, you go to colleges and universities, it's quite astonishing the number of young people who get jobs through being placed, doing a placement through university and in engineering and they end up working in that factory. And there's not enough of, of employers seeing how good the young people are. And I think they do tend to read some of the stuff they read in the, uh, the media, which tends to be pretty negative in young people, if they're honest about it as well. So there's a bit of that going on as well. Um, yeah, there's some challenges that we've talked earlier on about employability, job readiness, understanding workplaces, and you know, I've had a, you know, a report of just a young person falling asleep during a job interview, which is not a way to get a job. So there's some real challenges out there with some youngsters. But if we can get that exchange better, and I really do feel it's fundamentally wrong, and it's really funny, and interesting. For example, looking through the government's response to the Weed Commission, we've got this fantastic uh, group about you know, implementing curriculum for excellence. There's nobody from the private sector represented in that at all. Mm. Now, I know it's largely happening in schools, but what about this workplace? Mm. Who, can, who engages with that? There's no connection. And that, I could go through hordes of committees that we have in Scotland in a whole variety of sectors. The private sector just aren't, employers just aren't engaged. And then we expect them to know. Well, they're not largely engaged in schools, and we expect them to know about young people. Not all employers have children or might have older children and so on and so We need to get that engagement. And I think if we did that in, in both ways, both in terms of getting employers into schools and getting young people out of schools and into workplaces much more and a much wider uh, work placement scheme, then it would be beneficial in both parties. And I actually think they would see some gems and they would start employing them in better figures than you've reflected. It's not a good reflection. I accept that completely. Mm -hmm. Yes, Alan. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I spoke to a large employer who said they'd forgotten how to employ young people. And they'd recently engaged with us to start bringing young people back into the workforce, and their own workforce had loved it because they'd become buddies and mentors to young people. And it's something that perhaps 20, 30 years ago, everybody expected to have the, the young person join. You'd look after them through the early stage of their career. So they actually saw a huge engagement thing for their own employees. Um, and quite often if you just give young people a chance, uh, so I think this is one of the roles of the third sector, can be to sort of de-risk things for, for the employer. When, on last Wednesday, Marks and Spencers in Princess Street, um, in Argyll Street in Glasgow, took on 15 young people who probably would not have made it through the standard Marks and Spencers entry process, but we'd take them through a, a, a programme we developed with the employer um, over four weeks. They'd had some work experience and they'd done some of the life skills training uh, and worked on you know, polishing up the skills they did have. And actually, Marks and Spencer is happy to take every single one of them. And you know, they would not have been obvious uh, employees if you'd gone back. So I think for a lot of employers, it's asking them maybe to sort of look under the bonnet a bit more. Mm -hmm. And in cities like Glasgow, where what is it, one third of young people aren't working just now, you know, let's go into those pools of talent. Yeah. Because there's talent there, not a problem. Uh, and I think you know, a lot of those young people can be brought into the workforce with the right support. And it's really tough for employers. It's a big ask to take somebody that doesn't fit your standard criteria. They've all developed, I think, some fantastic apprenticeship schemes, but I think it's bolting the front end on how do you select, how do you bring people that maybe don't come from the traditional background that you're used to bringing into your workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where the third sector schools and a whole range of other people can help them uh, at that part of the journey. But just on that point that you raised there, I mean, you're referring to, to large companies mm -hmm. that bring 
youngsters on board and they've got employees that mentor <laughs> them, but the vast majority of Scottish enterprises are, small. are yeah. very small. Yeah. So how do you engage so, so, the small employer? Uh, and again, what we've tended to find, which, so it's a number of our programmes, we might have a large employer as the host, mm. or we've designed it round about the host, uh, and then what we'll do is we'll work with, uh, they might take 50 or 60% of the young people, we'll work with the other young people to find them opportunities. The Glasgow restaurateurs have been fantastic with our Get Into Cooking programme in Glasgow. We want run it through the City of Glasgow College. whole range of different restaurants are employing one or two people at a time. Mm -hmm will give young people a chance because they can see where they've come from, they understand the background of the course, uh, they can look in over the course of the four or five weeks. Um, so it's not a quick interview and I'm taking a big chance. Mm. Um, so I think that's how you engage the smaller employers, is just can you de-risk it for them? And by doing that and getting them involved at those kinds of levels, what you end up is there's a, there's a third part to um, David's, David's, which is that demystifying what the new curriculum and the new qualifications are because often you know if you uh, you, you get a, you know you get a taxi home at night and you say you know, what do you do and you go I'm a teacher and they go oh I get you know all grades and you're going well that's one two whatever number of qualification systems back and there's a, not an understanding here so and unless you're um, engaging within the, the schools and things and those are those are the kinds of projects that we see going on locally within lots of communities and I think it's again it's about getting a consistency and, and, and promoting that as a, as a way forward and in particular um, in the senior phase where you're looking at you know leaving destinations and leaving points dare I say for a third time moving to a senior phase that's over three years that creates space for young people to do that within their timetable rather than it being bolted on at the end of the school day or whatever when when they want to go and do what young people do so there's there's some there's some about something about that but you also see lots of projects that are going on in in, in primary schools where um the classes are going out to visit the local the local shops and different things as part of other projects which then gets them known in the area and starts to build those com those those community links and i think that those kinds of projects need to be promoted you know more widely okay so if we are to get more businesses involved whether it's to do mentoring or act as role models or to provide work experience and highlight the importance of social skills and attitude and life skills etc how do we do that so that it complements the work of teachers and it doesn't create a, a bit of friction in there? You do it locally. You, you, you allow for, for, for local um, discussions on it. You allow for, lo for, for um, learning communities of schools to, to consider what their local needs are, to look to the third sector and, and, the, and, and the, the, the private sector communities work within their areas to see what you know is is there and what are the, the likely destinations for young people within it rather than you know imposing projects that say every school's got to have Marks and Spencers because yeah. do you know what in, in Stranraer there is no Marks and Spencers so young people are not going to be moving in you know so they're, they're, it's about local it's about local local solutions okay Actually, I think it is very much local. I mean, I, I suppose I would say this, but I, I genuinely think that schools should be engaging very actively with the local business organisations. Very often, the FSB, because as your point is absolutely mm -hmm. valid, we're talking about very small enterprises in many parts of Scotland, and I think that's a thing we do tend to miss. I take Alan's point that there are some uh, good ways of doing that. That tends again to be focused on the larger areas of population. I think when we get out into places like Stranraer, and there's a real challenge. We have to, you know, we have to want to get the head teachers sitting in the round table and actually getting engaged with business people who can then call upon to come into schools to, to engage with young people, to advise young people and to give them work placements and that sort of exchange that I'm talking about as well. I think it's really important. And there is, and I know teachers have got a lot in their plate, but it's a vitally important thing. And I would also say the other thing I've never found in all my time with IOD, I've never once asked anybody to engage with young people and they've said no. They just don't do that. They are genuinely interested in the next generation. Um, and bluntly, they said no, you wouldn't want them anyway, but it just doesn't happen. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks so much. Siobhan. 
Thank you. The Food Commission's report's come up a number of times in the evidence um, you've given this morning, um, but regarding the third sector and the role that you play, there's only two specific recommendations in the Wood report about that, and there's a statement about employers and their role in education, um, and that, that seems to be it. So I'm just wondering, do you think the Wood report has given enough prominence to the third sector and employers? Briefly, um, the, the, what, what the Wood Commission does is sets out this, an, an aspiration for, for a whole education system. And I think the third sector, particularly in the youth work, because we would see ourselves as part of the education system, would perhaps see ourselves in some of those other recommendations more widely, if that makes sense. Um, but there's... Sorry, there's... No, oh, totally lost my train of thought. Sorry. <laughs> Come on, David. Jump in here. Yeah. I'm just saying, I, I, I've already had significant discussions with the government about I, I, employers in a wider scale getting involved. Both uh, There is a national group already been established, employer engagement, and they're going to look to do that across the country, which I think is very welcome, and sort of follow up in what we're talking about, actually, so there will be a... Uh, hopefully private sector led group of employers working with colleges, working with local authorities to actually implement the Wood Commission in a very real way. So if they do build in from really from day one as we get the work done, this real strong link, particularly around about work placement and building the pension, just has been talked about. So I'm optimistic, you're right, maybe not as many mentions might have seen, but and we already are, and to fear to government, they're already discussing with us and others how we actually get that implemented, and that's the most important thing. So that's, for me, very welcome. Okay. Uh, just to say, uh, 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 say if you, if you look, look in our evidence, that we've been uh, funded by the government, but also by the, uh, the Wood Foundation, uh, and soon enough have uh, put together a joint package to help us uh, engage with more schools and just give them some of those employment opportunities uh, or um, options. Uh, so we'll be starting that programme over the course of the next few weeks and months, and we very much hope to engage with more and more local authorities just to show them here is a way to do it. Now, I think to take the point earlier, it will be very different in the borders uh, in the Western Isles from how we would do that in uh, Glasgow or Edinburgh or Dundee. So I think that will be one of the things we'll want to explore is how we can uh, sort of uh, customise that to the needs of specific local authorities. Okay. Yes, thank you. Briefly to say that the young people we work with into their late teens and early 20s who we are supporting in to look at um, training and employment options, because they've had difficult lives and difficult relationships, they still need support around those issues and many of them are becoming parents themselves. So I think just to reinforce that what's happening around the young person in terms of their whole system, if you like, and their community supports also needs to be considered for successful involvement in employment. Um, thank you very much. I think that concludes the questions from uh, members of the committee. Um, once again, can I apologise for starting a bit later than uh, I think you'd been in, uh, indicated we would start, but uh, um, we very much appreciate you coming along this morning um, and for the written submissions you've given and other organisations given to the inquiry uh, on educational attainment. Um, that's the end of the, today's meeting, so therefore I formally close the meeting.